Social media has become increasingly intertwined throughout many of our lives in the past couple of decades. While many of us would have a hard time living without a car, many of us would also have an even harder time living without social media. Websites like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and others have become more than just a way to connect to relatives or old friends. For some, it's allowed us to gain an audience for our creative works. For others, it's become integral to our jobs and careers. However, in the past couple of years, I've noticed a very worrying trend among the big social media players. While Virtually all of them offer their services for free, it's becoming increasingly clear that there's nothing you can get without a cost. And the cost of some of these social media platforms are steep. I plan to go deep into the nuts and bolts of how these social media platforms operate and just what they've done to our lives. How they shaped human interaction, creativity, our understanding of our rights, and internet privacy as a whole. The things that I've discovered about many of these platforms in my research and over the years legitimately does frighten me. And I say that as someone who has built a career through social media. These things need to be brought to the public in a clear, concise manner. In this project that I call Technocracy, I plan on doing that. Like a democracy is the rule of the people, technocracy is the rule of technology. And make no mistake, the social media platforms do control much of our lives, whether we know it or not, whether we accept it or not. And unlike actual politicians or leaders of a country, the leaders of these social media platforms are often left without accountability. In this eight-part series, I plan to show you what these social media platforms are, what they've done, and what they eventually could be. YouTube was originally created in 2005 as a dating website, of all things, that has grown larger than many people could have possibly imagined or controlled. As a person whose career relies on YouTube, my relationship with the platform has gone from uneasy to downright frightened. Up until recently, my distaste has come from things like removing annotations and making other updates that just make the site worse for its users. However, YouTube's behavior has gotten increasingly disgusting, to the point where I can hardly use its service without a guilty conscience. Going through everything that YouTube has done would take over an hour, so we'll stick to the major issues. We'll start with one of the most infamous faux pas. Google Plus. Google Plus was a platform made to compete against the juggernaut that is Facebook. However, no one really wanted to use it, and it looked like Google Plus was on its way to becoming like Google Buzz, the Twitter competitor that Google had made that had also failed. Google made it so that to even comment on a YouTube page, you needed to sign up for a Google Plus account, something that even the creator of YouTube was not happy about. There were many protests at the time. You still might be able to find comments about Bob building an army in order to take this on. However, Bob did did not succeed, and the integration was messy to say the least. It led to the rise of many people impersonating the channel owner to do things like link people to viruses. Old comments could not be replied to, leading to the context of conversations being completely lost. People would write entire novel texts out in comments, and troll comments rose to the top of pages, as they were listed as comments that generated the most discussion. To this day, the dislike button on comments does literally nothing, as it's an artifact of this change. This is all because Google wanted their non-functional service to look better than Facebook. However, in 2018, it was finally discontinued. This is because the user data of a platform that people were forced to join was exposed. Google had known about this issue since March. They officially shut down Google Plus in October, after it happened a second time. Removing the integration was such an endeavor that they had to bring the website down in order to remove it. People's names, email addresses, occupations, ages, and whatever Google Plus collected was leaked for anyone to do whatever they wanted with. This happened because Google was more concerned with having a bigger number than Facebook, rather than having a quality product. If anything, the Google Plus integration shows the lack of concern that the platform has for its users. At some point, you should look up the story of New Coke. But America's emotional ties to Coca-Cola would be strained as never before during 80 fateful days in 1985. What was happening in the mid-80s was the market for sugar cola was a declining market. And so folks for the first time began to question whether or not people had actually become tired of the taste of Coca-Cola, had we finally reached a point 
a century after its introduction that, you know, maybe folks are just tired of this flavor. When the Coca-Cola company found that their sales were falling, they decided to change up their classic recipe to better compete with Pepsi. This backfired massively. New Coke was launched in a confident blaze of publicity. But public reaction was immediate and negative. All of the taste tests said people preferred the taste of this new product to the century old product. What they hadn't factored in was the huge emotional attachment there was to this brand. It didn't attract any new customers and it alienated old ones. So Coca-Cola had to roll back this product and to this day you can still find original taste printed on every single can. After the product was returned to normal, Coca-Cola did have a massive surge in profits. Some people think that that was the plan and it was all just a marketing tactic. But just because that was the effect doesn't mean that that was the intention. Either way, the point is that consumers used to care a great deal about invasive changes to the products that they had become accustomed to. It's hard to think of something like that happening in this day and age, especially when it comes to getting any website to change. This is because that many of them have a virtual monopoly. True, YouTube is not the only video sharing website. However, it is one of the few that is actually able to pay its users at a 40-60% cut. Several factors prevent other websites from competing with YouTube. And while it doesn't have a literal monopoly, it has a virtual monopoly. YouTube runs on a loss. Because the parent company Alphabet makes money through its search engine, it can employ the Walmart strategy. Lose money on one product specifically to cut down on competition. Other competitors have come and they have fallen. Zipcast failed because it didn't have the infrastructure to compete with YouTube. And Vidme failed because it couldn't get a good advertising service up in time. One that went around AdSense. AdSense is owned by Google, which owns YouTube, and it's the biggest advertising service on the internet, and something that wouldn't really want to promote competition, like Vidme. The landscape of the internet is also quite different in this day and age than the landscape that YouTube was created in, making it a lot more difficult for legitimate competitors to rise up. YouTube gained a lot of its initial audience via copyright infringement. A lot of people came to the site in order to watch old clips from shows they had watched growing up. Any website like that nowadays is going to have to face great legal difficulties. While you can find a lot of illegal uploads in places like Dailymotion, you have to remember Remember that Dailymotion is a French company, which is in the European Union, which is on its way to passing Article 13, which will kill Dailymotion, the second biggest competitor next to YouTube. The other reason it's hard for another YouTube to sprout up is because of personality. People came to the website for clips of shows, but they stayed for the personalities. These were people like the angry video game nerd or Filthy Frank. They made YouTube what it is for quite a while. However, now that YouTube is so big that it's attracting mainstream media, they decided that they're too good for these personalities. So we now hear news like like swearing cuts all ad rates by 50%. Unfortunately, most creators cannot go to another platform because the little that YouTube does offer and the less and less they do offer is still more than the competition. YouTube used to create celebrities. Now it worships them. And one of the most disgusting practices of YouTube as a company is how it continually sells out its creators. When the Wall Street Journal took out of context clips of PewDiePie to make him appear anti-Semitic, YouTube immediately cut all ties with him. His Scare PewDiePie Season 2 was canceled Canceled. This is the same website that decided to release the Thinning sequel, a movie that starred another YouTuber, Logan Paul. This YouTuber had gone to the Japanese suicide forest and filmed a dead body. Keep in mind that both of these productions were finished by the time that one was cancelled and one wasn't. The only difference is that one of them didn't have the Wall Street Journal attacking them. Why is that? I can only assume it's because he got plenty of criticism from within the community. And you can't make a case that YouTube is a horrible place if someone who does horrible things is criticized from within the community. This is why mainstream media is never going to attack people like Leafy is here or Keemstar. In the meantime, while YouTube was cutting down on the monetization of slightly edgy YouTubers, a new trend started to emerge. Finger family videos. Spider-Man and Elsa videos, and other content that showed famous characters doing very disturbing things like urinating on each other or jabbing each other with needles. They became increasingly prominent as people profited over exploiting their algorithm, and these were detected as family-friendly. Toddlers were often left to just watching these videos because of autoplay, and their numbers skyrocketed into the millions. It took years for YouTube to do anything about this despite these videos being repeatedly called out by its user base. 
If YouTube did not have double standards, it would have no standards. When Casey Neistat tried to make a video where all the money raised would go to a charity of the victims of a shooting, YouTube demonetized it, saying that that particular subject matter was not allowed to be monetized on their platform. However, when Jimmy Kimmel talked about a mass shooting, on their platform, it was allowed to be monetized, even though none of that money was going to charity. One thing that's going to come up time and time again is that many of these big companies use learning algorithms for specific things that you should absolutely not use learning algorithms for. Learning algorithms have a very specific goal, and they keep trying to achieve that goal. If they reach a fail state, they try something else. This leads to many false positives, especially towards the beginning. You can see this in action with seeing a learning AI try to beat a video game, for instance, like Super Mario Brothers. However, when the goal is something that requires context, like human interaction and speech, then the end goal can't really be reached, since the end goal changes constantly. If a company says that they are using a learning AI in order to figure out what obeys the rules of their platform, you should be very concerned and expect it to not work, especially at the beginning. It may eventually hit a somewhat reasonable level, but only after months and months of false positives. Which is why YouTube did not tell its users about the monetization algorithm until months and months after it had already been demonetizing users in secret. One of YouTube's biggest problems among its user base is how secretive it is about a lot of its practices. When criticized of a real or perceived error, they run experiments. Many users believed that they were losing subscribers whenever they uploaded something. It appeared to be some kind of glitch, since users lost hundreds or thousands of subscribers all at once, like at the exact same time. And they would continually be gaining subscribers on any day that they would not upload. YouTube then uploaded a video where, in an experiment, where they determined that this was not a glitch and people were legitimately losing subscribers in this very sketchy way. How many accounts did you think that they checked? About 100. Currently, there are about 1.5 billion people with a registered YouTube account. 100 accounts is less than a percent of a percent of a percent of all of the YouTube accounts that exist. But maybe their study was rigorous, despite its small sample size. Unfortunately, we will never know, because unlike real scientists who do real experiments, YouTube does not release their data for peer review. So it's impossible for the public to determine if they're lying in these experiments. We do not know any of the 100 channels that were checked. We do not even know if this experiment was really conducted at all. YouTuber burnout became a huge concern. As the algorithm demanded making more videos and making them faster, many creatives increasingly got burned out. When YouTuber Jaden Animations made a video about burnout, the YouTube creator Twitter account was quick to mention that YouTubers should never feel pressure to keep working endlessly. The problem with that is that by not keeping an upload schedule that's not possible for one person or even a small team to keep, the YouTube account will stop being recommended and all growth will be staggered. Some people can survive on long shortages, but for most people, making one video every two weeks is unsustainable as the algorithm demands things every week, every day. And as this treadmill sped up, we face more and more stories of YouTuber burnout. Another thing that YouTubers have to deal with is the site's copyright system. YouTube is allowed to exist through something called the DMCA Safe Harbor provisions. This means that they won't get in trouble for copyrighted material hosted on their platform, as long as they give the option for companies to take it down. This has been implemented in the worst ways possible. This system is supposed to keep YouTube out of trouble, but due to some aspects of it, it may push YouTube to actually breaking the Safe Harbor provisions law. When a video is uploaded, it may be tagged by copyright ID, or the copyright owner may manually claim it. The copyright owner can then do a couple of things. They can issue a strike immediately, they can block the video in some or all countries, or they can monetize it themselves. The system, however, is notorious for its errors. Random things can and will be claimed. People have gotten copyright claims for uploading their own songs that they have composed. Classical music, which is in the public domain, is especially prone to getting copyright claimed. At one point, even the sound of rain had been claimed. When a video is claimed, the user can dispute it. However, it's up to the copyright holder to determine if that claim is or isn't valid. Now, to be fair, some companies do remove their claim at this step, but there really is no incentive except goodwill among their audience to do this. After this, the user must once again dispute. However, it's exactly the same as before. The copyright holder is the one who determines if this claim is valid. There is just one minor difference, though. If the company thinks the video is not fair use, that one video that they said isn't fair use twice already, the video will go down and the owner of the video will receive a strike. However, the video doesn't have to go down immediately. The copyright holder can choose to take the video down in, say, a week. During this time, the YouTuber cannot speed up the process, and the copyright holder collects all the ad revenue, and there is literally nothing that can be done. The YouTuber can cancel their dispute and prevent the video from going down, but to do that prevents them from ever challenging on that video again. Also, 
this option is kind of illegal, at least if YouTube wants safe harbor revisions. The safe harbor must expeditiously remove or block access to the allegedly infringing material. And taking the video down in one or two weeks when you have the ability to take it down immediately is not expeditious. The point of being able to take down the video immediately is to stop duplicates from popping up. And if you don't care about duplicates from popping up, then you don't care about preventing copyright infringement. Even beyond this, copyright holders continually abuse their power, completely going against the idea of fair use. This takedown system has often been used to silence critics of work by malicious artists, developers, or designers. Sega of Japan once used the takedown system to get rid of videos of Shining Force 3, a game that had been out and unclaimed for decades, so that their brand new game would have better search ranking. Of course, if a video is put back up, all the company needs to do is claim the video again under a new name. Many of my own videos that were claimed and put back up by Viacom were then claimed by Viacom B. This has also led to a cottage industry of AdSense companies, companies that exist just to claim the AdSense off of video. The most notorious of which is AdRev for a third party, and they can get feisty to the point of taking down videos that were already put back up. This has happened to no less than two of my own videos. At least some of them actually work for the copyright owners. Some of these companies just create shell names to collect money off of other people's ad revenue. This is more than just an annoyance though. This is people's livelihood that can be at stake. YouTube may not be the most difficult job in the world, but it still is a job. At every single venture, though, it seems that making a living through the website becomes increasingly harder, increasingly pointless. If it's not the copyright ID system, it's the algorithm that forgets to factor in the human element. If it's not that, it's the demonetization system. As I've stated, some YouTubers have built their entire personality on being a little risque or a little edgy. Their choices now are to keep doing what they do to retain their audience and end up getting no money or change what they're doing and get no audience. However, the worst part about working on YouTube is that you could be terminated at any time for any reason. Now, this is true of many jobs, but when it comes to YouTube, since the computer usually determines who gets deleted, Many people have been deleted in error. This deletion issue has become so rampant that it's more or less become a rite of passage for your YouTube account to be randomly deleted. It has happened to many of even big accounts. Even people like the angry video game nerd have had their account deleted out of nowhere. I myself have had it happen. The channel I Hate Everything had it happen twice. And keep in mind, these are the big channels. The names that you've heard of. There are many more whose reach didn't get large enough by the time that they've had their channel deleted, and they had to start over from scratch or just give up. YouTube recently deleted 58 million videos. Considering their accuracy on other metrics, and the fact that YouTube gives no names or evidence of the deleted videos, I can only assume that many of them were deleted falsely, and quite a few innocent people have lost their jobs. One recently deleted channel is Adam Monkey Jones. If you don't know who he is, in general, he's a comedian. He's more on the edgy side, but it's hard to argue that he's not a comedian. He wasn't extreme in that regard either. And I do want to reiterate, edgy content, like Filthy Frank or Tourette's Guy, is what put YouTube on the map. No matter how ashamed they are of this fact, it is a fact. Mumkey's most prominent video series were his survival guide series, where he made guides to surviving hurricanes, communism, capitalism, etc., and the parody of the Nickelodeon sitcom Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide. His other series was videos on the shooter Elliot Roger, which is what got him booted from the platform. However, these videos were in a documentary style, which should be allowed by the terms of service. They went out of their way to understand what kind of a person would do the things that Elliot Roger did. This wasn't the first time that Monkey's channel was deleted. The first time it happened, YouTube themselves said that their deletion of his channel was a mistake, and his channel was restored. This time, though, They've determined through a personal conversation that his channel deserved to be deleted, even though one of the videos deleted was a private video that had zero views. This appears to be very targeted. On the flip side, there was a YouTuber in Chile who had filmed himself brutally murdering a pet cat. At the time of writing this video, his channel is still up, despite the community outcry. It's no wonder that there's been an increasing amount of outrage towards YouTube as a platform. It isn't about minor interface changes. It is about a stunning failure to act and a continual onslaught of selective enforcement. The Rewind this year, which is supposed to showcase all the wonderful things on the platform, had become the most disliked video in history in a total of eight days. People are angry about Monkey's deletion. Even the top YouTuber PewDiePie talked about this, but it's become increasingly apparent the change is not going to come. It really is great here on YouTube. In order to get big, you need to upload at a rate that's 
only possible with the team and keep bumping up your quality or your fans will stop watching you and after a few videos unseen, YouTube will stop alerting them to you altogether. You need to face glitches that cause your anxiety to spike, all the while YouTube is more concerned with changing the layout than fixing the glitches. And you've gotta hope that you can get big quickly enough or your channel will be deleted. Uh, but don't get too big because the media will take everything you've ever said out of context and then YouTube itself will throw you under the bus. YouTube to me serves as a testament that no matter how much users of a social media platform complain, how right that they may be, these websites and these companies will not care. They will do whatever they want without any input from the people who use their platform, and there's nothing that anyone can do. Regardless if this leads to people's data getting exposed. Regardless if this puts people's livelihoods at stake. Regardless if this leads to excessive amounts of burnout. Regardless of how many people who feel comfortable abusing animals and even people feel safe, feel safe using this platform. Regardless of even their own public image. They're going to drive this Titanic straight into the iceberg because that's where they believe the money is. And we're all trapped on board with them. They say that if something is free, then you are the product. This statement could solely be attributed to Facebook, and it would be more accurate than any statement ever spoken in history. What Facebook is, and what it is sold as to its users, are two different things entirely. Facebook is sold as a service that connects the world together, something that allows long-distance relationships to prosper. With Facebook, you can keep in touch with friends or relatives that you'd never get a chance to see in your day-to-day -day life. However, that's not really what Facebook is for. Facebook's main business model is to buy and sell information. Facebook earns its revenue by selling access to you and your interests to various advertising companies, based on the data that it collects from you. The stipulation is that these advertisers can't then sell this information to other companies. After all, data is much more valuable the less access that it has. When I uploaded the trailer to Technocracy, one of the sentiments that I got was, social media invades your privacy and steals your information. So what? Why should I worry? And to me, that sentiment was scary, or sad, or somewhere in between. Even more so that I feel that it's a common sentiment. Because of this, I am going to need to dedicate a portion of this episode to explaining why we should be more protective of our information, and more afraid than we are that these companies are getting access to it. Although I do understand the argument somewhat. Why should we be worried if someone like this man knows exactly where you are at every moment of every day? This is Mark Zuckerberg, creator of Facebook. Well, Facebook started life as FaceMash, opened in 2004, and it was set up as a hot or not type of game. It selected two random Harvard students that Mark Zuckerberg hacked from the student database. In its first four hours, it attracted 450 visitors and 22,000 photo views, and it got Mark Zuckerberg expelled. His crimes were violating copyrights, breach of security, and violating individual privacy. Let's just say that some things will never change. From this experiment, Facebook has become the biggest antithesis to the concept of privacy. It's something that would make every oppressive dictator and awful person in history wet with anticipation. So that leads to a very obvious question. How much does Facebook truly know about you? No one really knows the true extent, but some of the things that we do know are frightening. Facebook obviously knows what you tell them directly, like if you're married or not. It knows everything that you do while on Facebook, and it knows your entire search history on the platform, even if you deleted it. It also knows what websites you've been on, especially the ones that you frequent. We need to talk about the concept of cookies. Most websites use cookies to identify who you are, as IP addresses change too frequently to be useful for such a thing. By giving your browser a cookie, a website can remember if you've entered a password. Google, Facebook, and others track these cookies to learn all kinds of wonderful things about you. And that's just on the internet. If you have Facebook on your phone, then Facebook knows where you are at all times, and possibly even more. After Facebook gave us the option to download our information, after a wide swath of criticism from high-ranking officials, users began finding very disturbing things. One user, Dylan McKay, found that Facebook had recorded the details of every phone call and every text that he'd made for two years. During an interview with a Wired reporter, an employee asked them to turn off their phones so the company would have a harder time tracking whether it had been near the phones of anyone from Facebook. And even if you don't own a Facebook account, 
you still have a Facebook profile. They are what has become colloquially known as shadow profiles. Let's say that a guy named Kevin uploads his phone contacts to Facebook, and one of them is for a guy named Steve. Steve hasn't joined Facebook, but now he has a shadow profile. If another user signs up who has Steve's number in his phone, well then Facebook can be sure that this is the same Steve, and it can begin making more inferences about this person. Inferences that it can sell to advertising companies. If Kevin uploads a group photo and says that Steve is in it, Facebook knows and it automatically knows the next time that Steve appears in the Facebook photo because of their facial recognition software. And even if you delete the photograph, Facebook still keeps it. It's not paranoia, it's in the terms of service, and it's completely legal. This is a bigger problem than you might realize. It's not just creepy, it's a miscarriage of justice. In the United States, we have the Fourth Amendment. In theory, it grants us immunity from unreasonable search and seizure. The idea is that it's supposed to prevent things like the police from wiretapping you or going into your house without a warrant. Now, they don't even need to do that. If you're someone that the government doesn't like, all they need to do is subpoena Facebook or Google, and all the information that they've collected on you now belongs to the United States government. But if you have nothing to to hide and you have nothing to fear, right? Well, in 2016, someone had spoofed my email in order to use it to send terroristic threats to other countries. All the FBI had to do was subpoena Google, and they knew everything about me. All someone has to do is accuse you of something, and your information could be made public. Beyond that, not everyone who buys access to your data has your best interest at heart. One infamous scandal was that of Cambridge Analytica. They had been harvesting personal data from millions of Facebook accounts, and they used it without their consent for political purposes. They were stopped in 2018, but a reporter from The Guardian broke the story in December of 2015, and this was brought to Facebook's attention. What Cambridge Analytica actually did was made a quiz. Not only did it allow them to get information of the people who played the game, but people who were Facebook friends of people who played the game. Cambridge Analytica used the information to psychologically profile Facebook users, and then send them very targeted ads. For instance, if you clicked on things on Facebook that hinted that you might have been nervous about losing your job, Cambridge Analytica would know, and then they'd be able to send you an ad that targeted that specific fear. This is a service that was built into Facebook. In September of 2018, hackers exploited a series of bugs to access the Facebook accounts of 30 million people. Remember, this was after Facebook gave you the option to download the data about you that they had collected. 60 device makers were given access to user data by Facebook, including a Chinese telecommunications company that U.S. intelligence has expressed concerns about for years. We need to talk about the private company argument. One argument that often comes up when we talk about internet censorship, the capitalization of privacy, or other violation of rights is that, quote unquote, these are private companies, they can do what they want. This is an argument that we really need to discuss. Companies left unfettered do massive damage to the society around them, and internet companies are no exception. While they may not cause the ecological problems that other private companies would do if they could, quote unquote, do what they want, internet companies hawk for social control. Facebook is indeed a private company. However, many people don't seem to be aware what that truly entails. Companies have terms of services, but they tend to be so vague that you need a lawyer to parse them and see where you as the client stand within them. They're not legally binding contracts either. Social media platforms can and have changed their terms of service without any heads up notice and your only options are limited. Discord had a change to their terms of service. Either you give up your right to a class action lawsuit or you don't use Discord. As we've established, Facebook also doesn't need to follow the Fourth Amendment. But the biggest area where this argument arises is on the First Amendment issue. There have been concerns for years now that Facebook has been censoring speech that it doesn't like. In 2016, a former employee accused Facebook of leaving out conservative topics from the trending bar. Facebook denied this accusation. Two years later, it's hard to verify the accuracy of this, especially since left-leaning people in general are more likely to share articles than right-leaning people. However, it did create, or enhance a perception. People who consider themselves conservatives reduced usage of the site, which may have led to a self-fulfilling prophecy. Facebook's relationship to the freedom of speech is complicated. Facebook has deleted images that they believe violate their terms of service. This includes images of breastfeeding, naked mannequins, and same-sex couples kissing. You don't have to post these things publicly either. Messaging something privately to a friend on Facebook can get your account banned. This is the same company in 2017 that asked its users to upload nude photographs of themselves to prevent revenge porn. Facebook claims that it does have dedication to combating hate speech. Let me read their policy directly. We do not allow hate speech on Facebook because it creates an environment of intimidation and exclusion, and in some cases may promote real-world violence. We define hate speech as a direct attack on people based on what we call protected characteristics. Race, ethnicity, national origin, religious affiliation, sexual orientation, caste, sex, gender, gender identity, and serious disease or disability. We also provide some protections for immigration status. We define attack as violent or dehumanizing speech, statements of inferiority, or calls for exclusion or segregation. For a website with such a dedication to preventing hate speech, it's interesting what they let slip. Currently, there are 14 countries with laws against Holocaust denial. 
Facebook only helps to enforce this law in four of them. The ones that are most likely to take up litigation against Facebook. Germany, Austria, France, and Israel. But Facebook is so against hate speech that it allowed a genocide to proliferate in Myanmar. Government officials were able to target the Rohingya minority directly through Facebook. People of high social caliber blamed them for every social ill imaginable. They shared fake news, all in an attempt to promote ethnic cleansing. Meanwhile, other people used Facebook to deny that it was happening. All in a country in which Facebook is so widely used that it is synonymous with the internet itself. It's not like Facebook couldn't do anything either. The earliest news stories about this surfaced in August of 2018. This is around the time that Facebook banned Alex Jones, a very controversial conspiracy theorist. He was getting millions of hits through Facebook alone, too. From the business perspective of a private company, this makes a lot of sense. Many users in the United States wanted Alex Jones gone, regardless of his right to be there. It was a good business decision. Most users in Myanmar wanted to spread hate against a minority. From the perspective of a private company that should only be interested in making money, it sounds like just business to allow hate to proliferate. Facebook is a private company. They don't have to follow the First Amendment. They could selectively go after hate speech only when it benefits them. They don't have to follow the Fourth Amendment. They can know everything about you. They don't have to follow the 14th Amendment either. 2018 was not a good year for Facebook. In August, the U.S. Department of House and Urban Development filed a complaint over Facebook's advertising practices. People who are advertising on the site could discriminate on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, familial status, and disability. This was used by companies that advertised housing. You see, back before it was illegal, people who sold housing tried to convince white people to sell their houses at low prices by promoting a fear that racial minorities would be moving into that neighborhood. And then they'd sell the same houses at a much higher price to black families. This practice is called blockbusting. It is a practice that has been illegal since the 1968 Fair Housing Act. Housing advertisers could use Facebook to facilitate Blockbusting. Also, according to a ProPublica article, journalists were able to specifically target and advertise to anti-Semites. Facebook said that the lawsuit was without merit, but they still signed an agreement with the state of Washington to remove this ability. However, advertisers can still choose to show ads to only men or to only women. No, Facebook doesn't have to obey the law. They're above the law. Remember, they're a private company. If they don't have to obey the First Amendment or the Fourth, why should they be expected to follow the Fourteenth? A lot of the internet is a numbers game, and that's clearly the only thing that Facebook cares about. Do you know? videos on Facebook are muted, uh, but still autoplay? That's because if a video goes on for six seconds without interruption, then it counts towards a view. On top of that, Facebook has a very we-don't-give-a-shit attitude towards copyright infringement. Many people have gotten very internet famous for taking a video from YouTube and uploading it on Facebook. Many creators found their own videos re-uploaded on Facebook with millions of inflated views, while their own original video hardly got anything. This has actually had far-reaching consequences all over the internet. Because of these inflated video numbers, news articles didn't look so lucrative. So, thinking that video was the wave of the future, most media organizations fired writers in order to hire video producers. The video producers then got fired when the truth came to light that Facebook videos were worthless for a brand. Facebook video views were inflated by 60 to 80 percent. And this has done huge swaths of damages to online media. Some of you may think that this is a good thing. Internet media news organizations are not very popular at the moment. This is because when a media organization is dying, they'll start to lash out, purposely making people mad, smearing other people, and even downright lying. Anything in order to get clicks to just stay alive. If the media is desperate, it seems very likely that this is at least in part because Facebook lied to them. Facebook has lied to all of us about a lot, and it's been a very negative influence on modern life. Many of us have already quit Facebook. Since 2010, May 31st has been Quit Facebook Day. Many more of us would have quit Facebook long ago, but it can be very hard. Once Facebook sinks their teeth into you, it can be rather difficult to quit. I don't mean that it's hard to quit inane postings, or looking at what some random person you've never heard of is up to. For some people, Facebook is the only way that they're able to keep in touch with long-distant friends and relatives. It's a lot more useful as a communication tool than, say, a simple phone call, or even an email. Facebook stays alive by keeping relationships hostage, and I want us all to realize how cruel that actually is. It's not that Facebook violates our privacy, it's that it's cultivated an internet culture where that's something that we're okay with, where we're complacent with. Facebook has been the pot boiling the water slowly, and we're finally starting to realize that. But the water is just too warm to get out. Not that that'll help, because every other website is now using their methods. We should consider our information a lot more valuable than we do. 
we are too quick to give it away for convenience, or even in some cases, less than that. Remember, when you give your information to Facebook, you're not just giving it to Facebook, you're giving it to companies, some of which only want you to buy their products, but others want to manipulate you politically, or target you based on attributes that you cannot control. You're giving your information to any random hacker that can exploit Facebook's loopholes. You may even be giving this information to rogue employees, and with one subpoena, you're giving your information to the government as well. One more thing, Facebook has spent a lot of money trying to smear people that they don't like. Facebook, in the past, has hired a hit firm to finance public relations to spread lies about its critics. So if anything happens to me in the production of this documentary series, you'll know why. Making the Twitter episode of Technocracy has been the most difficult video that I have ever had to make. Every single one of these episodes in Technocracy is going to have its own difficulties, with the exception of YouTube. I had years worth of first-hand experience for that one. The Facebook episode dealt with the argument of why we should care about our online privacy, which a lot of people don't care about. The Google episode is just going to have so much to talk about. And in the Payment Processors episode, I'm going to have to talk about some very controversial people. And then there's Twitter. Twitter is special, and it's got a lot of all of these problems. When I started the series, I didn't have a specific reason for most of the order. The biggest stuff, Google, Apple, and so on, was geared towards the end. We started with YouTube because that's where we are. But if I wanted to keep that order with things getting more serious as we go along, Twitter would probably be just under Apple and Google and the payment processors, and how destructive they are when it comes to online media. We're not even halfway through the series, and I already know that Twitter will be the most difficult episode, because Twitter is special. In this episode, I will need to talk about Twitter's political bent, and in doing so, I will need to talk about the right of freedom of speech, as it pertains to the internet. I will also need to talk about some very controversial people. I want to make it very clear at this point that the point of technocracy is not to criticize the users of these sites. Some of their actions I do find morally reprehensible. Many of their opinions I disagree with. I am not here to defend their actions. Here's the way I see it. I can believe that murderers should be punished without believing in the death penalty. You may have heard this saying before. I may disagree with what you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. This is going to be the overall theme of the Twitter episode. The purpose of this documentary is not about shining a light on the users of these sites, no matter who or what they are. The point of this documentary series is to focus on the platforms themselves and the cultures that they have established. When working properly, a social media platform is just a tool, and like any other tool, it can be used for good and it can be used for ill. Any sick individual can use a website to showcase themselves brutally murdering a cat. That alone says nothing about the context of of any platform. However, when a platform chooses to censor speech they disagree with and allow the cat murderer, that says something. This is going to be incredibly important to keep in mind as we talk about Twitter. In my opinion, Twitter has become one of the most destructive forces to common discourse in our modern era. I believe it is the cause of two huge problems in our society. I believe that Twitter is a large reason that online news media has fallen to such low quality in recent years. I also believe that Twitter is a major contributor to how politically divided we are as a society at the moment. Twitter is a special platform. When it was first created in 2006, its users could only type to each other in 140 character messages. This has since been doubled to 280 in 2017. But throughout its history, Twitter's main drawing point was that the messages were short. This fact has been questioned or even complained about by many of the users of the site. However, there's a reason to argue that this limitation is actually one of Twitter's greatest strengths. In the years since Twitter's creation, many competitors have risen and fallen that would allow users to create microblog messages to their followers of 500 characters, 1,000 characters, 10,000 characters, or even more. Almost every single one of these websites have failed. And why is that? Well, when you're writing that many characters, you may as well just have made an email newsletter or a blog. And there are better websites for doing that that hold more features than a Twitter parody. The character limit was never meant to be a benefit for the people who tweet. It was always a benefit for the followers of these people. People on the internet generally don't like to read a wall of text, even if it's from personalities that they follow. When Twitter forces people to boil down their thoughts to a minimal amount of characters, it can help retain audiences whose attention span can be very limited. This way of communication cultivated the psychology of early Twitter. When the site was first formed, these short messages were very good at allowing you to post thoughts without any real inhibitions. When you're writing down a blog post or an online journal, for instance, it gives you plenty of time to think about what you're posting, and it gives you ample chance to hit the delete button. With such few characters on Twitter, it becomes out of sight and out of mind within minutes. Back then, Twitter conversations were more or less modeled after 
real conversations. What you said was meant to disappear into the ether before very long. Back in the early days, Twitter didn't even let you reply or chain tweets. But that's not how the internet works. What you post online does not disappear into the ether. Many people have had a Twitter account for well over a decade at this point, with all of their early tweets still available. And this contradiction has caused much hardship for many, many people. It's getting to be an old story at this point. Many people have posted something stupid on Twitter and have had their lives utterly destroyed. The most famous example, and one frequently cited in the effects of internet shaming, is that of Justine Sacco. In December 20th of 2013, she posted this. She went on a plane for 11 hours and came out the other side as a social pariah. When she went on the plane, she had just 170 followers. Within the span of 11 hours, the hashtag, Has Justine Landed Yet?, was the number one topic worldwide, and she had lost her job. This hashtag was promoted by celebrities and many online bloggers, even some online news publications. People were feeling joy and catharsis when this person that they had no idea who the hell she was had lost her job. What you need to know is that this tweet was not made in earnest. Justine Sacco was mocking the type of person that she was accused of being. The problem is that Twitter abhors context, and that can be dangerous, especially when it compares to the mob mentality that has been cultivated on Twitter. When you're one drop in a bucket, it's easy to write the next, you're a horrible person and go about your day. If you're the first person doing it, well, it needed to be said, right? When you're person 50,000? Well, it doesn't matter. They've heard it so much that you're invisible. Corporations have made complete 180 moves, and people have lost everything that they've earned because of a Twitter hate mob. If your name is trending on Twitter, it's never a good thing. Google people who are fired over tweets, and you can get lists of hundreds of them. And I mean, it makes sense. They deserve to have their lives destroyed. They had one fucked up thought or one fucked up opinion. They deserve to lose their entire job and every other job afterwards. It's justice. Mob justice. The best kind there is. We get to sit comfortably in our home and tear down a person that we'll never be able to see. Even if their words or actions didn't directly hit us. And I'll bet the even more people not big enough to make headlines or financially secure enough to make ends meet after being fired also deserve this, right? They said some fucked up shit. Damn the context. In the United States, you can be fired for what you post to Twitter or any other social media site. At this point, it's become common practice for employers to search through your internet personality uh, before they make a hiring decision. However, in the United Kingdom, Canada, and in other countries, people have been questioned by police or even arrested for non-threats that they have posted to Twitter specifically. This is going to be a very difficult discussion we're going to have, but this is one that we absolutely must have. We must talk about freedom of speech and how it applies to the internet. Because people are getting arrested for their own personal opinions in countries like the United Kingdom. Let me be clear, I can find their opinions disgusting, but I can find how they are treated disgusting as well. In my opinion, in any country where you're arrested for making a joke, you do not live in a free country. The earliest example of something like this happening was several years ago with the story of Gregory Allen Elliott. He was a freelance graphic designer, but that's not what got him into trouble. He is most well known as the person who made a video game on Newgrounds which allowed players to punch a photograph of an outspoken feminist, Anita Sarkeesian. He did this before to another critic of video games, Jack Thompson. It's seemed to be his thing, doing this to critics of video games. This action was combined with tweets that his accusers found threatening, and I would like to state that Anita Sarkeesian was not his accuser. Gregory Allen Elliott was released on bail with the condition that he could not have a smartphone or use a computer with internet access. Considering that he was a freelance graphic designer, the fact that he wasn't able to use the internet brought him into financial devastation. The only reason that he was even able to afford his court fees is because his story had gotten out into the wider public over concerns of free speech. Because he was merely accused, he was cut off from the revenue sources that he would need to be able to fight his case. To top things off, on January 22nd of 2016, the charges against Elliot were dismissed. It was declared that the tweets that Elliot made were engaging in legitimate debate, not harassment. The man was facing up to six months in prison for engaging in debate. He had lost years worth of work over this incident. Even though he wasn't arrested, to fight off an accusation of this, he was essentially unable to use the internet with a job that requires use of the internet. However, at least he was declared not guilty. The United Kingdom has been far, far worse in regards to freedom of speech, 
especially as it pertains to the internet. The UK specifically, many police departments have been building staff specifically in order to control speech and arrest people who have politically incorrect opinions online. This is a country that has a growing problem with night crime, and their police departments are focusing more of their resources on people who are mean on Twitter. Recently, a mother was arrested for dead naming a trans activist. The debate over free speech on the internet is a very complicated one, but it is one that we must have. Like with the privacy argument in the Facebook chapter, I will have to spend a large amount of time talking about free speech and how it applies to the internet hate speech, and of course, the private company argument that refuses to die. I will be talking about these other countries in context, but I will be talking about freedom of speech in an Americentric way. This is intentional, as virtually all these platforms that I am talking about are hosted in the United States and are abject to United States laws. The United States has the strongest freedom of speech in the entire world. There are very few things that you can't do speech-wise. You can't lie about people, and even then, slander is hard to prosecute. You can't issue people threats or use fighting words. You can't shout fire in a crowded theater, or anything else that would create an immediate danger, and that is largely the limit. In the United States, almost anything else is game, and there are reasons for that. This argument comes up a lot in the discussion over hate speech. Many people say that hate speech is not free speech. This is factually incorrect. Hate speech is protected by the First Amendment, and it has been repeatedly upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States as such. And it makes sense. Inoffensive speech does not need the protections of the First Amendment. Offensive speech, speech that people find questionable, does need protection. And I believe that it is kind of important to allow this to be free speech. There are reasons why, and I will explain them as we go along. But if you live in a country where you can get arrested for having the wrong opinion or calling someone the wrong name, then I reiterate, you do not live in a country that has free speech. Twitter is very welcoming to the trans community, having banned misgendering people or deadnaming them. One of the stories that broke the news in November of 2018 was that of the trans exclusionary radical feminist Megan Murphy. She was permanently suspended for replying to someone stating, men aren't women though. Later, her ban was lifted. She explained what was going on and then she was banned again. Now she is taking litigation towards Twitter. I want to ask you, what if the shoe was on the other foot? Imagine if these social media platforms came up 10 years ago, or Silicon Valley was one of the reddest counties in the nation. Imagine getting banned from all social media because you supported gay marriage, for instance. Imagine getting arrested for violating obscenity laws because you posted LGBT art. The first rule of creating a weapon is to expect it to be used against you, and there is a real possibility that this may be a part of the future. There's a lot to unpack here, but we should start with talking about echo chambers. An echo chamber, when we're talking about a social media echo chamber, is a place where people are able to seek out information that only agrees with the world you, and anything that goes against it is completely discarded. This tends to strengthen these people's worldview to be more and more extreme. Most social media platforms allow users to create their own echo chambers you know, with blocking and all of that. However, many, many of these websites have echo chambers built in. I could be making this point about Reddit or Tumblr, but Twitter's echo chamber is the most problematic. It's tempting to say that Twitter is a left-leaning echo chamber. It has been reported that Twitter is so liberal that its conservative employees do not feel safe to express their opinions. Here's an article written by a PhD that says that Twitter is biased against conservatives. However, it would be inaccurate to say that Twitter is strictly biased towards the left. After all, you'd be hard-pressed to call TERFs right-wing. Twitter is specifically biased towards the progressive viewpoint. The site is so pro-trans rights that people have been banned for the statement, men aren't women. The site is so pro-Islam that people all over the globe have been warned for tweets that violate Pakistani law. There have also been accusations that Twitter has been housing and supporting pedophiles. Tumblr had a major problem with pedophiles on their site. After that site's crackdown on not safe for work content, many of them migrated to Twitter, in order to try and form a new home there. In Twitter's defense, they have banned a prominent pedophile activist, Amos E, but that can be attributed to public outcry. It took a while for them to do something, and there are many other of these people active on the site. This is probably a good time to talk about hate speech laws, and one of the reasons why they are very, very dangerous. Pedophiles claim that what they have is a sexual orientation. People who disagree with this, me included, believe that they have a mental illness. However, a mental illness is a disability. Both discrimination based on sexual orientation or disability tend to be banned under hate speech laws or statutes. And that seems to be the stance that Twitter was taking for quite some time. Any group of awful people with sufficient criticism can claim themselves a part of an oppressed group and then place themselves above criticism with hate speech laws. Twitter itself is filled with double standards. Sarah Zhang is a reporter who was infamous for tweets that were discriminatory towards white people. Twitter had ignored this entirely. She was then hired by the New York Times. Candace Owens, a black and 
conservative, tweeted the exact same things, but she switched the races and the religions to make this specific point. And she was banned until public outcry allowed her back on. Jesse Kelly was a conservative talk radio host. He was permanently banned for no reason whatsoever and only got his Twitter account back after media exposure brought him back on. One of the more infamous stories that showcases the landscape of Twitter is the site's reaction to the Covington Kids scandal. During the 2019 March for Life, a pro-life event in Washington, D.C., controversy exploded when students from Covington Catholic High School were seen standing in front of a Native American man, smiling and wearing a Trump hat as the Native American man banged a drum. When the story broke, this is all that we knew, and people went far and away with their own narrative. So before we continue, I should explain exactly what happened in this incident. At this March for Life event, a group called the Black Hebrew Israelites were chanting racial slurs. The students from Covington Catholic High School started chanting things, like their school slogan, to drown out the slurs. And then the third party, the Native American man, walked up to one of the students and banged his drum. The student stood there with a nervous smile as he didn't know how else to react. This event became one of the biggest political Rorschach tests in history. Many people on Twitter expressed outrage at the students, when all they saw was a student smiling at a Native American man wearing a Trump hat. And by outraged, I mean that they issued death threats, including one user who said that they wanted to lock these students in a burning school. Twitter did nothing towards any of these people issuing death threats. Some of them are still up today. But they will ban someone for saying that a man isn't a woman. Many people argue that Twitter is under no obligation to follow free speech, in spirit or to the letter. You'll hear this frequently on the internet. The First Amendment only prevents the government from making laws that abridge the freedom of speech. So, you know, our government can't arrest us for calling someone the wrong name, or teaching our dog to mock Nazis. However, there's more to the story that shows that Twitter's relationship to free speech is a bit more complicated than they're a private company so they can do what they want. We've had this argument before. In the 1980s, there was a case, Pruneyard Shopping Center versus Robbins. Coincidentally, this case took place in California, the place where Twitter and the rest of Silicon Valley is located. Some high school students were soliciting signatures for a petition in a public shopping mall, and the owners of the mall didn't want them to do that. The holding of the law is that a state can prohibit the private owner of a shopping center from using things like trespass law to exclude peaceful, expressive activity. You see, the United States Constitution has a negative right to free speech. That means that the government can't make laws to break the right. However, California and many other states have affirmative right to free speech. Under the U.S. Constitution, states can provide their citizens with a broader rights in their constitution than under the federal constitution, so long as those rights do not infringe on any federal constitutional rights. While the obvious thing to say here is that shopping centers are not Twitter, some people have suggested that this holding can apply to internet speech although this has not yet been tested. However, it's probably just a matter of time. This is because of the idea of a public forum. Back when the United States Constitution was made, the public forum was the town square, a government-made and maintained road, essentially. But the public forum changes over time, from a town square and a town crier to solicitors in a shopping mall to, well, pundits on Twitter. You see, Twitter is actually very powerful. Scary powerful. Nowadays, almost every celebrity, every personality, every politician has a Twitter account. One of the most infamous users is the current president of the United States, Donald Trump. While he wasn't the first president to have a Twitter account, he was arguably the first person elected through Twitter. If you are logged off of or banned from Twitter, your use of Twitter is severely limited. You can no longer see tweets and replies, which may be a part of a deeper, more important conversation than just the normal announcement-style tweet. By being banned from Twitter, you are forbidden from seeing some messages from your representatives. This is a serious problem, and the problem goes the other way too. Since Twitter is a private company, and not holden to electors, and can thus do what they want, they could theoretically bump off a politician that they don't like. In November 2017, Donald Trump's Twitter account was temporarily banned by a rogue employee on their last day of work. Who's to say that Twitter's other workers can't do that to smaller people? Smaller people whose story won't get out. I know that a lot of people hate Donald Trump, and probably got a chuckle out of hearing that he got banned, but we do need to focus on precedent. There are very bad things that will happen if we do not address this now. If we give these platforms the ability to be selectively biased as they are, well, times change, cultures change, and the people who are in power changes. Who's to say that in 10 years we won't have a right-leaning website censoring everything slightly left of crazy, while conservatives say it's just a private company, they can do what they want? Right now, there's already a parallel internet forming. Many of the sites I am covering, or have covered, have competition based on specific concerns of said website. For example, DuckDuckGo was created due to concerns over tracking by Google. However, the platform that was meant to compete with Twitter is Gab.com. Gab.com was created with the idea of adhering to free speech, no matter the cost. 
cost. This has cost them greatly, being deplatformed several times. As of now, their reputation is at rock bottom. Just look at that Wikipedia article for them. It's known mainly for its far-right user base, it's a part of a series on anti-Semitism, it has been criticized by scholars as an echo chamber for right-leaning content dissemination. Well, yes, when people get banned from every other platform, they tend to go to the one that won't ban them. You can censor people, but that doesn't mean that they just poof out of existence. They go somewhere else, and the internet is a very big place. And now, they're angry at you, and they aren't going to be discussed out of their delusions. Saying that somebody can't say something because of how offensive their content of their language is doesn't make their ideas go away. The only way to get rid of bad ideas is to talk people out of them, essentially. And let me be absolutely clear, a parallel internet is a dangerous and destructive thing. Right now in the United States, we appear to be in one of the most politically charged times in history. It's obviously not the worst that it's ever been. The Civil Rights Movement and the Civil War were far more tumultuous. But it's safe to say that things haven't been like this in quite a few decades, and the internet is largely to blame for this. An echo chamber can do very bad things. Most people think that the only reason that it's bad is because it prevents you from seeing opposing points of view. That is a problem, but that's not the main issue. Echoes grow louder. While in an echo chamber, your opinions get reinforced. Your beliefs become hardened, less likely to be questioned. And in turn, you get more extreme. You end up surrounded by people who end up trying to out-extreme each other, to show how much they're on the right side of the argument. This is why people have such a negative reaction to virtue signaling. More and more people closer to sane start getting blocked or move from the platform. Then you start talking about how terrible the other side is. This is how regular social justice activists become SJW snowflakes, and how regular conservatives become far-right, alt-right, neo-Nazi extremists. You wonder why we're so politically divided in this day and age? This is why. We've become far too comfortable in echo chambers to the point where we're attacking the concept of freedom of speech. Damn the consequences. Related to this are concerns that Twitter is shadow banning people. Shadow banning is when Twitter bans you, but they don't tell you. Essentially, your messages stop peering towards your followers. They claim that they don't do this, but the technology is there. Instead of blocking people, Twitter allows you to mute them. It essentially means that you block them, but they won't know that you block as it just stops their messages from getting to you. Who's to say that Twitter can't mute you for everyone? However, there is some plausible deniability. Chances are that the shadow banning is uh, accidental because many, many people on Twitter use block bots. A block bot is a group of users that an opinion leader has gathered that basically auto blocks a bunch of people. So you don't have to think about it. Just install the block bot and they're all blocked. Who are these people? If you're using these, you don't care. They're probably a troll or a bot anyway. Anything to protect the echo chamber. You don't even need to think about protecting it. If you end up being blocked by a lot of people, Twitter will stop showing your tweets to other people so much. So if a bunch of people use a block bot that blocks, say, all conservative politicians, and conservatives don't do the same to liberal politicians, then an organic bias will arise. Believing that Twitter's sole audience is more left-leaning, they'll adapt policies, and the cycle will continue. The company does have plausible deniability here, but I'm not saying that it isn't biased, because Twitter absolutely is biased. One thing that Twitter certainly does control is a verification badge. Many websites give users something similar a little signifier to showcase that this is the real person on their real actual account, and not somebody impersonating them. It's there to prevent fraud. However, Twitter can and has removed the badge of users before. Was it because they were actually an impersonator and they were trying to correct this? No, it's because Twitter has decided that it doesn't like these people. The first person that they removed the verification badge from was the right-wing provocateur Milo Yiannopoulos, and it has removed badges from other people for quote-unquote violations of the rules. This is not the point of verification. The point of verification is for identification, not how well you can follow the rules. If they're breaking the rules, ban them from the site. By removing the verification badge, what you do is give them plausible deniability. See, that wasn't really me saying that. And yes, if you're wondering, it is much harder for conservative people to get a blue check mark. This is because blue check marks are a clear form of endorsement, which is actually dangerous for Twitter. You see, there's a difference between a platform and a publisher. On a platform, when every single word and person is treated equally, the platform has no real responsibility for what has been said. However, when you start promoting certain people in certain words above others, you become a publisher, and publishers can be found liable for all kinds of things, like incitement or negligent publication. If someone was, say, harassed by a bunch of people with blue check marks, and a blue check mark is a sign of endorsement by Twitter, Twitter can be found partially liable for whatever has been said. This is interesting because what Twitter seems to be most biased towards is journalists. It's no secret that most prominent journalists have made a large home on Twitter. There are a variety of reasons for this. I mean, as I said, most of the politicians are on Twitter, and this is where the news is broken anyway. 
However, Twitter structure really helps bad internet journalism, i.e. clickbait. How do you get people to click on your site? All you need to do is make a misleading or really catchy headline. That'll draw people to your site. However, if the article isn't up to snuff, people might complain. So what's a place where you're expected to abridge things heavily and make something really catchy, where you're not expected to elaborate? Just showcase a really hard-hitting snippet. Maybe something that only lets you type in 280 characters. I'm not saying that every journalist on Twitter is awful. There are good journalists on Twitter. The problem is that the culture of it kind of allows them and even expects them to be bad. Many of the journalists follow each other on Twitter, and you probably guessed this by now, but that creates an echo chamber. One person will break a story. Their followers, also journalists, will see this. They'll need to report on it, but how do you make your story stand out? You're not the first person reporting on this. You need to make it a bit more extreme, use some stronger language, and if all else fails, start making things up. The cycle goes around a bit, and when it gets back to journalist number one, the story is entirely different. They might think that this is new info on the story and report this exacerbated information. This is largely what happened during the Covington High School incident, and it's happened on many other occasions. I'd highly recommend not getting your news from Twitter, specifically because there are so many journalists there, and Twitter will take their side over yours every single time. One of the most recent controversies is the learn to code meme. You see, when an industry would be failing, like coal mining for instance, many journalists would write articles that didn't show the least bit of sympathy, telling these blue collar workers that they should quote unquote, learn to code. Recently, many internet news companies were suffering from massive layoffs. So people who were getting tired of the internet sensational stories used this as an opportunity to kick them when they were down. They responded to these journalists by telling them to learn to code. Long story short, the journalists kicked up a fuss and declared that it was a harassment campaign. There have been reports that people have been banned for telling journalists to learn to code or just even typing in hashtag learn to code. You'll also know that the favor has been returned to Twitter. Most journalists don't have have a negative thing to say about Twitter. If you do, you must be an alt-right troll. Gab is bad, it's home of neo-Nazis, and it supports freedom of speech. Those things must be intertwined, except they're not. One of the things that this series, Technocracy, has been criticized for is that it only points out the problems and not the solution. And there's a reason for that. The first step in solving these problems is realizing them and agreeing on them. Right now, the debate over freedom of speech on the internet is raging, and that's really, really unfortunate. I know I have and I will have to defend many people who have done or said stupid, shitty things, and I highly doubt that helped much. Please understand that I do not endorse their opinions, but proper discourse is important. A lot of people think that freedom of speech is just for people who want to be assholes and shout racial epithets. I hate those people as much as you do. I hate that they do it, and they don't help their own case. It makes freedom of speech a lot harder to defend harder to want to defend. And I hate that that's where the battlegrounds are, but that's the circumstance we're at. If we keep these tools of censorship around, the shoe will be on the other foot someday. At least keep that in mind. You're never going to get rid of assholes, racists, sexists, awful, awful people. They will always exist. It's been said, though, that sunlight is the best disinfectant. We have the resources and the arguments to fight this shit. You might be able to censor speech, but you won't really be able to get rid of these people or their opinions. They will go somewhere else, and their opinions and outrage will get stronger. This is one thing that Orwell was dead wrong about. He believed that if you manage to censor enough, the thing that the popular party didn't want would just go away. It would die. But it doesn't. When people are censored from using a certain word, for instance, they come up with new words to be an asshole. If they can't use retarded, they'll make up the word spurg. They'll find new places. If they can't use Twitter, they'll use gab and knocking them off doesn't help you. When you're able to discuss with them though, help bring them back to reality, that's how you get rid of the nastiness in the world. And as you push more and more people away, you also push yourself further down your own rabbit hole. There's a reason that virtue signaling is seen as a bad thing. It shows that you're in an echo chamber and you're selling out your true beliefs and intentions to be in that echo chamber, which is bad for society at large. Any one opinion taken to its extreme is extremely bad. Even ideas that I really like, 100% democracy, for instance, leads to mob rule, and that's bad. A lot of people hate the horseshoe theory, and for good reason. It's not so much a horseshoe, but a ring. You go too far to the left or too far to the right, you end up in a not good place. Time changes. Those who cling to the private company argument, would you really want to live in a world where a social media platform hosted all the politicians, all of the news, and only wanted to elevate racist rhetoric. As you alienate more and more people from Twitter, from Facebook, from YouTube, alternatives become bigger and bigger. Sooner or later, one of these are going to have a larger audience, 
and thus more power than Twitter, especially as more and more moderate people are increasingly getting pissed at these sites. I mean, journalists aren't the majority of the users on Twitter. In fact, they're only a very, very small minority, but they have the largest influence. It's very possible that TERFs, neo-Nazis, or other terrible people could become the primary influencers on that next Twitter. You may have sunk Gab's reputation, but you can't get rid of them all. If you want a solution to our technocracy problem, throw the, they're a private company and they can do what they want shit in the trash. I can think of some other companies that did what they want. Enron is a company that did what it wanted. BP Oil is a company that did what it wanted. In the US, we have a prescription painkiller epidemic because of a company doing what it wanted to. In the 1970s, Nestle convinced third world mothers to stop breastfeeding and use their formula, which had to be mixed with contaminated water, spiking the infanticide rate in those countries. Another company just doing what they wanted. What Twitter is doing is largely indefensible. If you want to hear some of their defenses, Jack Dorsey was recently on the Joe Rogan podcast twice. The first one, he was alone. In between these two times, Joe Rogan had an interview with Tim Pool, an outspoken critic of Twitter. And in the second one, Tim Pool was on this uh, podcast. He really stuck it to Twitter. So if you have a lot of time and you want to do further research on Twitter specifically, from someone who understands his infrastructure a lot more than even I do, I would recommend watching those three videos back to back to back. It'll give you a, a good context for how these Silicon Valley CEOs try to justify what they're doing. Also, if you live in Canada or the UK or any other country that can jail you over a joke, the easiest thing that you could do is block every single police Twitter you can get your hands on. Maybe even make a block bot for that. They won't be able to see your tweets, or at the very least it'll make them much harder to see your tweets, so that will make it harder for them to prosecute you. When I hear stories from UK or Canada about this stuff, it really, really is worrying. On December 17th, 2018, the microblogging site Tumblr died. While the website is still up and mostly functional, it had made a single, solitary decision that has since cost it astronomically. As I write this, it's less than half a year later, and the site has already lost at least a third of its user base, and the site's usage continues to decline day by day. I can feel confident in saying that Tumblr will not live to see the next decade. It may still be online, but it will probably be regulated to the back corners of the internet, where it will largely be forgotten. The next MySpace, if you will. However, this time it wasn't a new up-and-coming website that killed Tumblr's relevance. Tumblr's death came largely from a self-inflicted wound. In the weeks leading up to December 17th, Tumblr came right out of the gates in a post where they said that they were going to ban all adult content, no matter how old you were. Adult content in this context means pornography, photos, videos, illustrations, or anything that depicts a sexual act. It goes by the colloquial term, not safe for work, or NSFW. Many of the standards that the site set forward are confusing at best. According to Tumblr's own standards, nudity found in art, such as drawings and other illustrations, were allowed. However, if you ask a computer, the only difference between a pornographic drawing and artistic nudity is your hypocrisy. More on that later. The most infamous standard is that female presenting nipples specifically were banned. This is terminology that the website itself used, and it's a great indicator with the main problem of Tumblr's adult content ban. Banning female presenting nipples only is not possible. According to the internal logic and culture of Tumblr overall, it is up to any individual person to determine what they themselves present as, at any given time. And that's just for people taking actual photographs themselves. How can you determine what a drawing, or even someone that an actor is playing, presents themselves as, considering that these characters aren't real? With a loophole that easy to exploit on the face of it, it was very clear that this adult content ban was doomed to fail from the start. And that's not even talking about the less surface-level problems. 
Tumblr has a reputation for being very left-leaning, the most out of any commonly used social media platform. However, it was largely an open secret that the thing that most people use Tumblr for was its erotic content. The fact that they have lost so many users since their adult content ban is definitely evidence that there is merit to this myth, as Tumblr's infrastructure has never really been the best for microblogging. If you want to find something that somebody posted to their Tumblr two months or even two weeks ago, and that person posts frequently, good luck with that. You'll either have to search through the mess of an archive that might maybe possibly give you a clue as to what you're looking for, or you'll have to start at the most recent thing that someone posted and scroll your way back. A lot of Tumblr blogs also keep loading their backlog onto their same page, so if you bookmark a page and come back to it, then you have to start your search all over, from the beginning, the most recent post. The archive feature also has very limited use. If someone has posted two pictures on one post, the archive will only show the first picture. And some people use tags. Most people don't. It was never the overall website design that attracted people to Tumblr, as WordPress or Blogspot would allow someone to do most of what Tumblr did with far better infrastructure and far better results. What Tumblr had going for it was its culture. This move, the adult content ban, largely killed every bit of it. And that goes beyond just the people that were there for the adult content and left because of its removal. But a lot of people left because of how Tumblr tried to police its website in the aftermath. Policing the internet has become one of the greatest challenges of our modern society. A lot of shady dealings do happen on the internet, and stopping things like cyber criminals, sex and drug trafficking, electronic hacking, and other internet crimes are becoming increasingly important. This leads to the question that is the theme of this episode. How do you police the internet, or even a single website like Tumblr? What do you do if you want to get rid of all of the bad stuff on the internet, whether it's legitimate crimes or, in this case, adult content. I'm not even asking, how do you get rid of this stuff without casualty? You're allowed to cast as wide a net as you wish. How do you get rid of this one particular thing without, you know, destroying everything? Let me put some numbers in perspective. There's an estimated 1.8 billion websites on the internet, and that number grows by over 100,000 each year. Keep in mind, that's websites, not web pages. Tumblr is one website, but each post on each Tumblr blog is its own web page. As of January 2019, there are over 246 million blogs on Tumblr alone. It sounds big, but it's smaller than the 6,000 tweets or 2 million emails sent every single second, or the 1,200 million terabytes of data on just Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Facebook combined, or the 300 hours of video uploaded to YouTube every single minute. In the grand scheme of big numbers, Tumblr's number is actually relatively small. Right now, there are five different ways that people are trying to police the internet with these big numbers in mind. The first is human moderation. The benefit is very obvious. Going back to Tumblr's desires, only a human is ever going to be able to figure out the difference between artistic nudity and a pornographic drawing, because the distinction only really exists in opinions. Humans can give the most one-on-one -on -one dedication. If a human is directly controlling what's going on, there will be some kind of consistency. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing largely depends on the moderator, though. And of course, there's far less chance of getting swooped up in false positives that algorithms tend to produce. There are plenty of problems with human moderations, though. The most obvious one is that the scale is absolutely impossible. If my math is correct, to manually go through all of the currently existing Tumblr blogs, it would take about 860 years if you checked each blog for only a minute. And keep in mind, some people have been posting for years and years. That's just for a quick check. On websites like YouTube, the comments under the 300 hours of videos being posted every single minute are now coming under scrutiny. It would take about 100,000 employees to make even a reasonable attempt to catch up, ignoring the comments and ignoring YouTube's backlog of videos, which consists of hundreds of thousands of terabytes of data literally years of footage. Also, being a human moderator does have legitimate risk. It's not all about searching for copyright infringement or racist assholes. Former human moderators have actually taken litigation against Facebook because they have begun suffering from symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and other anxiety disorders. It's not just mean people on the internet that they need to deal with. They can come across videos of violent murders, suicides, beheadings, terroristic recruitment videos, animal violence, sex crimes, and anything else that sick assholes upload to the internet. Recently, the Christchurch shooter live-streamed his act to Facebook, and millions of copies of the same video have spread all around that website alone. And as a human moderator, you can't get away with telling yourself that it's Hollywood magic, because this is reality, the reality in which you live in. Real-world police get specialized training for this kind of thing. Human moderators tend to be unpaid volunteers. And let's not forget the other issue. Humans are humans. Humans have their own social and political baggage. They have double standards, or they may 
may even have no standards. And humans are prone to making a lot of mistakes. If one human moderator gets annoyed by a meme, well, they'll keep targeting that meme and its banning de facto becomes the rule. The worst example of direct human moderation comes from Reddit. Many moderators there end up taking over subreddits and turning them into echo chambers, banning anything that might try to break those echo chambers. Moderating the internet is not a job for humans, at least not directly. That brings us to the other main choice, algorithms. A static algorithm tends to be reliable for exactly what you want it to do, and that is all that it is good at. If you want to ban a copyrighted character, for example, say you are China and you wanted to ban Winnie the Pooh, you could program an algorithm that will block any showings of that character fairly accurately. It can comb through entire websites with speeds that humans cannot imagine. However, the problem with algorithms is that humans are very good at adapting, and static algorithms do not adapt. You can take Winnie the Pooh, recolor it blue, and start calling it Blinny the Blue, and the static algorithm won't detect it. It would need to be updated manually. Many people get around YouTube's copyright matching algorithm by rotating the screen, zooming in, or adding other similar effects, like snow on the screen. And algorithms are easily hacked to the user's own benefit. When YouTube's attention algorithm only counted views, people made misleading thumbnails and title cards which worked to get the views. A static algorithm is incredibly easy to figure out and bypass, even if you don't understand the technical side of algorithms. Just figure out exactly what's being blocked and use a little creativity to subvert it. Static algorithms also have an issue of false positives. A fan animation may be a bit too similar to the actual animation and get copyright claimed. A dog dressed up like a bee might be seen as a bee by the algorithm and ends up being ignored when the algorithm was programmed to get rid of all pictures of dogs. Really, the only thing that a static algorithm has going for it is scale, and that's only in the present. When you have a user base of 450 million people, a good chunk of those people is going to learn exactly how to manipulate that algorithm and sidestep it. If you want an algorithm to truly be effective, you need to update it constantly, which is why why Tumblr employed a learning algorithm. As I've discussed before, learning algorithms are computers that have an end goal and they learn from their mistakes as they do so. One of the most popular uses of them is to have a computer learn how to beat a video game, such as Super Mario Bros. or The Impossible Game, and they are very good at that specific thing. This is because the target that they are programmed to reach is static. The objective of a game like Super Mario Bros. never changes, and the enemies and the obstacles are in the same place no matter how many times that you play. Human interaction is not static. What certain words gestures and behaviors means are different at different times. In the United States, for example, putting up your index and your middle finger is known as the peace or victory sign. In the UK, and many other countries, this is an obscene gesture, on the level of flipping the bird. But it's largely the same gesture. It just depends on the context, and context is something that a computer generally cannot see. When a computer comes across friends playfully insulting each other, as friends do, the algorithm has to make a choice, a false positive or a false negative. Remember Tumblr's ban on female presenting nipples? There is no way for a computer to learn how the subject of a photograph presents themselves as, unless they are specifically told for each individual subject, which isn't going to happen, especially in the case of fictional characters. If an insult can sometimes be a good thing, if the difference between artistic nudity and pornographic nudity is an opinion, where the answer keeps changing depending on individual context, a learning algorithm cannot be used to obtain the answer. Computers need a clear, concise, and consistent target. Human interaction is none of those things. Not to mention that learning algorithms may be more hackable than static algorithms. In 2016, Microsoft released a bot called Tay, who was supposed to be an AI reminiscent of a typical millennial. They released Tay to Twitter and several other platforms. She was given a learning AI that was meant to help her understand conversations. She was able to speak in text, meme, and emoji, and Microsoft apparently had high hopes for her. And when the denizens of the internet learned this, they pounced. In the span of 16 hours, various trolls from places like 4chan had learned about this bot and trained it to become a genocidal maniac, taking advantages of the vulnerabilities in its learning algorithm, and the bot was forced to be retired, all in the span of 16 hours. Now imagine if somebody wanted to alter a learning algorithm that was supposed to block certain people or track down cyber criminals. If an algorithm has a moving target, it tends to be confused and not very accurate. If a learning algorithm is fed incorrect information, backfire or embarrassment may be the least of your issues. It's not hard to feed a learning algorithm bad or incorrect information, especially if you have access to a lot of people with a similar interest. Regardless, every learning algorithm has one universal flaw. They are always terrible to begin with. A learning algorithm is almost designed to fail at the start. It will essentially choose what to block at random to specifically gather false positives, and this is our 
already caused significant damage for people who are using learning algorithms for things that they should not be using learning algorithms for. YouTube's demonetization algorithm was a learning one, lowering the ad revenue of completely random videos without telling the users who uploaded them. But even taking this into context, Tumblr's learning algorithm was among the worst. Tumblr's adult content ban was only supposed to apply to pictures and images. They specifically stated that words and erotic stories would have been absolutely fine to exist on Tumblr. This algorithm initially flagged Tumblr's own blog post, stating that they would be blocking adult content. This blog post only contained words. All too often, it seems like people employing learning algorithms give them no parameters to start with, like only target pictures and not words. Perhaps they thought it was a six month job to program this, and it turned out that it would take two years to get this up to snuff. Learning algorithms are a technology that's clearly not ready for this kind of massive scale. They feel like they're on par with the virtual reality technology of the 1990s. We can see the idea, we can imagine it, but it's nowhere close to what it's supposed to do. It's being used for the incorrect things, and all too often, it feels like programmers trying to get out of their job. With most of these learning algorithms, it feels like someone is saying, I'm too lazy to program this thing, so I'll program it to do my job for me. Whether or not that's the case from the start, it's believable in the results. As of now, a properly working learning algorithm is science fiction. So if humans and computers are both not the right tools for policing the internet, what about top-down moderation? It sounds simple. You make a rule from the top, and you make sure that whenever you find something that goes against that rule, you remove it from the base. Sometimes you'll use a computer, and sometimes you'll use your own human discretion. Tumblr, for example, was removed from the Apple Store, because Tim Cook has gone on record that he doesn't want any pornographic material on his website. We're looking at every app in detail. What is it doing? Is it doing what it's saying it's doing? Is it meeting the privacy policy that they're stating, right? And so we're always looking at that. Um, should we raise the bar even more? We're always looking at improving and raising the bar. Uh, but, but we do carefully review police. each app and police now. And we don't subscribe to the view that you have to let everybody in that wants to, or if you don't, you don't believe in free speech. Mm -hmm. Which is very Right? We value. don't believe that. Yeah. We don't believe that because we're like the, the guy on the corner store. What you sell in that store says something about you. And if you don't want to sell that other thing, you don't sell it. It doesn't mean that you can't use an iPhone to go to your browser and go to some porno site if you want to do that. Mm -hmm. But, but. Nobody does that. But, <laughs> but I'm not making fun of it. No, I know. But, but I'm just saying, but it's not what we want to put in our store. Right. We want kids to go to the store, right. right? Because kids, there's a lot of learning education apps in the store. And, and so we've always done that. We've um, worked for the music industry to code things explicit. And so a parent could say, I don't want my child to listen to explicit content. We've uh, made sure all the movies are coded in such a way where uh, you can say, I only want my child looking at G movies or, or, or whatever. Or uh, we have a parental control around apps. You can say, I don't want them on these certain apps. And, uh, and so this is something we've always felt you know, really well, Mark responsible Mark Zuckerberg, for. what would you do? What would I do? Um, I wouldn't be in this situation. But that's not all. HN was solicited from Google, and YouTube videos about global warming linked to the Wikipedia page about global warming. Twitter and Patreon have trust and safety councils, and websites like Facebook work with certain organizations and charities to help make their standards. We can examine the problems with this when it comes to YouTube's attempt to curb misinformation about global warming. There are many issues with how they're going about this, but let's start with the fact that they're linking to Wikipedia. Wikipedia itself has gone out of its way to state that it is not a reliable source, even for events that happen on Wikipedia. The biggest problem with Wikipedia itself is that anyone can alter articles to meet their own ends. Sometimes it's accidental, and sometimes it's not. From there, a journalist, or someone else, can use the information on Wikipedia to write up their own piece about this topic, with the misinformation. This new piece can be used as a citation of the original Wikipedia article, even though the fact was totally wrong. As you've learned in school, Wikipedia is where research starts, not where it ends. And that's another problem. When you can't even follow a standard that grade school children were expected to follow, how do you think you're going to convince a conspiracy theorist out of their delusions? Not to mention, YouTube linking to Wikipedia on certain videos is editorializing. 
Which means, once again, like Twitter, they risk their safe harbor protections. They end up being responsible for what is posted on their website, because they are putting their own opinions into the matter. Other websites that are frequently used in top-down fact-checking have just as many issues. They're being ran by humans, and humans have their own biases. And sometimes they like to play politics. Let's take a look at Snopes. Snopes is used by a lot of these big websites to do fact-checking on their websites. But let's look at one particular example of one of Snopes' major flaws. Did Hillary Clinton destroy her phone? That is the question. They rephrase the question to, did Hillary Clinton use a hammer to smash her mobile phone during an FBI investigation? They consider this a mixture of true and false, because Hillary Clinton, personally herself, did not physically destroy her phone with a hammer. According to Snopes, one of Hillary Clinton's aides told the FBI that on two occasions he disposed of her unwanted mobile devices by breaking them or hammering them. But it's only a mixture of true and false, because Hillary Clinton herself did not personally destroy her phone with a hammer. Sites like PolitiFact and Snopes frequently change up the wording of questions so they can say whatever they want to. When the original statement is considered partially true because they've rephrased it, are these the kind of people you want to trust fact-checking your website? You wonder why there's such a problem with conspiratorial thinking in recent years. That's largely because of how conspiracies are being dealt with. It's very, very difficult to get a conspiracy theorist out of the hole that they're in. You cannot do it with raw facts, because it is not facts that got someone into this place. It's emotion. Most people who believe in a conspiracy whether it be government cover-ups, pseudoscience, or other misinformation, they have heard the correct information. Most of them just dismiss it or move the goalposts in their conspiracy. When you do something like link to the Wikipedia page on global warming, congratulations, you become in on the conspiracy, according to a conspiracy theorist. And they made it harder to pull these conspiracy theorists out of their delusions. This leaves us with a few other problems when talking about conspiracy theories in general. Why, in my opinion, is it a bad idea to just outright ban conspiracy theories from your platform? The first and most problematic is that everyone is prone to conspiratorial thinking. Even the people who have taken it upon themselves to give us the correct information whenever a conspiracy theory pops up. After Steve Jobs, the creator of Apple, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, he decided to reach out to alternative medicine and resisted the orders of doctors. That was his choice to make. But would you want someone with a mindset like that to be able to dictate to you what a conspiracy theory is? People can believe all kinds of insane things. And just because someone is in charge of Apple, Google, Twitter, or Tumblr, doesn't make them immune to this. And someone working at YouTube or Twitter or Facebook could just as easily link people to misinformation about vaccines if somebody there truly believed that they were harmful. And what of the politically correct conspiracy theory? Ever since the 2016 United States election, people all over all of the big social media sites believed that the president colluded with Russians during the election. Whether this is true or not, it's the technical definition of a conspiracy theory. Now we are getting information that it was unlikely to be true, but that's besides the point. It was, by the technical definition, a theory about a conspiracy. It had all the hallmarks of one, a government cover-up about the people in power being shady and manipulating the general populace. And let's not forget the final issue with policing conspiracy theories. Not all of them are false. If you want to take a stand against these kind of things, sooner or later, one of these conspiracies is going to turn out to be true. And by hiding all the speculation, you may be enabling very shady actors to get away with their crimes. What happens when criticism of, say, Google becomes a conspiracy to Google's algorithms. On November 16th of 2018, Tumblr was removed from the iOS App Store because of one of these attempts to police the internet. I want to be clear, as far as I can tell, this is the reason. The common belief is that child pornography was found on Tumblr, and Tumblr hasn't done enough to stop it. However, Tumblr has specifically denied this accusation. In their own words, let's first be unequivocal about something that should not be confused with today's policy change. Posting anything that is harmful to minors, including child pornography, is abhorrent and has no place our community. We've always had and always will have a zero tolerance policy for this type of content. To this end, we continuously invest in the enforcement of this policy, including industry standard machine monitoring, a growing team of human moderators, and user tools that make it easy to report abuse. We also closely partner with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and the Internet Watch Foundation, two invaluable organizations at the forefront of protecting our children from abuse. And through these parameters, we report violations of this policy to law enforcement authorities. We can never prevent all bad actors from attempting to abuse our platform, but we make it our highest priority to keep the
the community as safe as possible. Let me be clear, Tumblr never cited being removed from the App Store as a reason for their radical change in direction. Apple has also never specifically stated why they removed Tumblr, but Apple as a corporation has stated that it wants nothing to do with pornography in general. Banning all adult content on Tumblr did massive damage to the site, and something like that could have only seemed like a good idea if the alternative was much, much worse. Like being removed from the App Store. Why would Apple state anything to the contrary? Tumblr being removed from the App Store because it had a child pornography problem could only benefit Apple in any and all negotiations, especially because they already couldn't care less if Tumblr dies. It doesn't even matter if it was true or not. The myth is enough to benefit Apple. If Tumblr was willing to make this massive change, you think that they could have done something to be specifically harsher on child exploitation without incinerating everything else on their platform. Personally, I believe that they took this scorched earth policy because they had to do it. If Tumblr was just removed from the App Store, it would have hurt a while, but they could have survived with their content intact. Appeasing Apple has done too much damage to be truly a benefit. I believe that the cause of the adult content ban was because of the fifth and final category of internet policing, laws. In 2018, the United States government passed two laws, SESTA and FOSTA, the Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act and the Allow States and Victims to Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. You've probably heard this term before, safe harbor. It's what allows many websites to exist in their current form. If someone uploads something like copyrighted content, the website itself is not liable for this. And this also applies to almost any crime committed on a website. SESTA and FOSTA were the first laws that began to strip away safe harbor protections. If a third party posted ads for prostitution on, say, any one of Tumblr's 450 million blogs, Tumblr itself could be found liable for this. This includes ads for consensual sex work. The goal of the law was obvious. Stop sex trafficking and prostitution rings. What actually happened? Many websites took very big sweeping steps so that they didn't get in trouble, and very little was actually done to stop sex trafficking. Because, first of all, this anti-sex trafficking law does not target sex traffickers. It only targets the place where sex trafficking happens. To put this into a real-world context, it's as if you were robbed in a store by a deranged psychopath, and the law determined that the store owner was also guilty of this crime as well. In the way that the law was written, websites are specifically encouraged not to moderate for this activity. According to the letter of the law, moderating against sex trafficking is not a defense against this law. If you knew that there was sex trafficking on your website, you are guilty. And if you are moderating for sex trafficking, well, obviously you know that there is sex trafficking on your website. So what do you have? Websites like Craigslist removing their personal section, YouTube removing sketchy comment sections altogether, and Tumblr removing all adult content on their website. And if sex trafficking does show up on any of these websites, which it probably still does because it's impossible to remove anything from these websites, the platforms need to be less compliant for their own protection. The law requires them to avoid knowledge of how their platform is being used. SESTA and FOSTA are classic examples of feel-good bills, the ones that have very moral sounding names and intentions so you sound horrible if you protest or vote against them. Combine that with a law that addresses the internet and you have a perfect storm of disaster. This law is likely to do what the law did to pirated materials. People are going to start opening shadier websites in countries that don't care about American laws, and away from sites where the crimes are at least visible and prosecutable. The problem is worse here because this law isn't about stolen music. This law is about the victims of sex trafficking, which are now harder to discover, and that's on top of the more minor everything else. Because of these changes, a lot of good people have found themselves in an uncertain position due to the after effects of it. Many very talented artists have made a home on Tumblr before this happened. One of them is Sleepy Corvid, the person who drew the title card for the Technocracy series. Some of them have found their main home online falsely flagged as adult content, and even more of them have had their audiences flee because of Tumblr's mismanagement. The common response is these people should get a quote-unquote real job, but doing things online does not make these jobs not real. People who would say that an artist using an online platform like Tumblr or DeviantArt doesn't have a real job, would you say the same thing towards a character artist at a fair? Would you say that they don't have a real job? The people who make their careers online aren't just vloggers. There are chefs, teachers, artists, singers, comedians, actors, programmers, journalists, filmmakers, artisans. Just because someone does something online doesn't magically make the work or talent that they need to have to be successful less, or less real. Our laws that police the internet tend to do more damage than they prevent. All it takes to avoid these laws is to sidestep to another country, and we have tools that let us do this easily. Most laws pertaining to the internet end up being unenforceable at best. Article 11 and Article 13, for instance, are laws that are meant to take action against copyrighted content in the European Union, but it's not going to work. Let me state it like this. Say you made a law to make it illegal to post pictures of dogs on the internet. How do you even begin to remove them all? In the billions of pages that Google 
has indexed. What do you do when people start to protest and use proxies or VPNs? You'd have more dogs on the internet than ever before. And this is the legacy of everything that you just try to blanketly remove from the internet. Whether it's pictures of dogs or something truly terrible, like sex trafficking, or the manifesto of a mass shooter. The only thing that's going to fail is the new and upcoming websites that don't have the money or infrastructure to compete. And when I'm calling a site like Tumblr small, a law like this is not going to last because it's not enforceable, and a law that isn't enforced is not a law, it's just a suggestion. To answer the question, how do you police the internet? The answer is the same way that you count all of the stars in the observable universe. The short answer is that you don't. The scale of the internet is literally incomprehensible to the human mind. This video is just one of 5 billion videos that are watched every day on this one website. That's not all the videos that exist, or that are even uploaded, to this one site. That's just those that are watched. We are steadily approaching 2 billion websites total on the internet. If each of them had only 15 web pages each, and this includes websites like YouTube that have a dedicated URL to each and every video, there would be more web pages than stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Even if two thirds of these websites are not active, that leaves you with 650 million individual websites. This is more than five times the amount of books in the entire world. Trying to get rid of the bad things in a space like that isn't just legally impossible, it's technically impossible, if for no other reason than just the scope of it all. We have to accept that we will not be able to catch everything. That doesn't mean that we should try to stop finding new things and do our due diligence when things are brought to our attention. But if you think that you could just remove something from the internet with a flick of a switch, that is a grand testament to your ignorance and how badly you do not understand what the internet is. Moves by people to police the internet who do not understand the internet tend to lead to the worst aspects of our technocracy problem, like internet censorship. People have been able to use this thing not just to express themselves, but to bring light to the horrible conditions of their own nation or environment. They can tell us about problems or perspectives that we would have never otherwise considered. And censoring the internet, whether by accident or by intention, leads to a lot of very real human suffering. I don't care if you're China, Pakistan, the European Union, or New Zealand. Attempting to censor the internet like this exacerbates the problems that you're trying to get rid of. And when a government censors the internet, it is a human rights abuse. It leads to actual people actually getting hurt. You restrict the access of information to the innocent citizenry. Meanwhile, you send criminals underground where they can proliferate in areas that you cannot observe or prosecute. One VPN or one website out of your jurisdiction and the people you're trying to punish get away with no issue. Meanwhile, innocents get hit in the crossfire. In July of 2009, the online shopping website Amazon removed the books Animal Farm and 1984 from their platform. This is because the books were added to the store by a company that did not have the rights to sell them, according to an Amazon spokesperson. This is understandable, as even in the real world, things go out of print all the time, and what can and can't be sold does change. When it comes to copyright across countries, things can be even more complex, as different countries have different laws as to what can enter the public domain. This should have been where the story ended, but it didn't end there. This this was only the beginning. Not only was the book removed from the Kindle store, but it was deleted from the Kindles of people who had legally purchased the books from Amazon. And this isn't the only example of Amazon deleting books from customers. People have reported that the books of Ayn Rand and Harry Potter novels have been randomly deleted from their libraries, usually because someone did not have the rights of said books managed to get past the ever watchful eye of Amazon. However, in all cases, these books were legally purchased on the consumer side. The consumer had done nothing wrong. Early in April 2019, a digital game storefront, the Epic Game Store, had a bug. For two hours, the video game Detroit Become Human went free. To consumers, this was not an out of the ordinary occurrence. Many games on Steam, the most popular digital game storefront, do have sales that can total in very high percentages. Some games even offer free weekends, and even Epic itself offered the video game Subnautica for free. However, as soon as the bug was fixed, 
the game was removed from the library of everyone who had obtained it through this bug. For context, the director of publishing strategy at Epic Games had stated something like this would not happen on his How Games Are Made podcast, stating that users would be able to keep bug purchases through the Epic Games Store if the bug was on their end, and in this case, the bug was on their end. When presented with this evidence, he stated that this policy does not relate to free copies. Unfortunately, according to the law, a $0 purchase is still considered a purchase. The games were taken back after what amounted to a legal purchase. In 2016, some users of Apple's iTunes have reported that music files saved on their computer were removed without their permission. People have begun to speculate that Apple Music was deliberately deleting these files and replacing them with DRM-laden copies. However, according to Apple, this was caused by a bug. These three examples may be described as accidents, but they showcase a very chilling reality. Digital distributors have showcased the power to be able to take away things that you have legally purchased. This has a wide array of implications, and it leads to very many questions. The most obvious and the most important one is, is this even legal? You've probably heard of this before, that you don't own what you purchase from digital distributors like Amazon or Apple. This is a physical DVD. If I buy it, I truly own it. I could do what I want with it, and that includes many different things that almost sound illegal. I can lend it out to a friend. I can legally make backups of what I purchased by ripping and burning it. I can't sell those backups, but I have the right to make backups of my own property. And I can sell the original DVD that I bought. And the seller of the DVD, or the maker of anyone behind the DVD, has no right to tell me that I can't, as per the United States First Sale Doctrine. As the story goes, though, this doesn't apply to digital media. You don't really buy what you purchase on Steam, Amazon, iTunes, or other places you've probably heard. You may have heard that what you buy is a license to use them. In most cases, you'll find this software is licensed, not sold, somewhere in the EULA. However, this story is largely fictional. A EULA is not a law, but they are subjected to the laws. A corporation can put whatever they want into one, but if the end user license agreement has clauses that say, the corporation may never be sued if you use this product no matter what happens, generally they will not hold up in court. And some things may also be completely unenforceable. In one notable example, GameStation obtained the souls of 750,000 people because they put that in their EULA, and people don't read the EULA. EULAs tend to be tools of intimidation, using language so dense that the average reader can't comprehend them, and worded in a way that makes it appear that the corporation has more power than they really do. I want to say that I am not a lawyer, but I have done a lot of research, and I'm going to help parse this in order to help prevent any myths and confusion. Here's the thing, when you buy a physical program on a disc, like Microsoft Windows, you will still get the same EULA. This software is licensed, not sold. This is one of those things that's made to sound more intimidating than it really is. Speaking of Orwell, this is a classic example of doublespeak. If you want an example of doublespeak, it's this software in this software is licensed, not sold. In this context, the software does not mean that the software you currently bought off of iTunes or Amazon or Steam or Microsoft. The software refers to the intellectual property of the software. In essence, you did not buy the rights to Microsoft Windows when you bought a copy of Microsoft Windows, so you can't really modify it and sell it. However, you do own that particular instance of Microsoft Windows, no matter where you bought it, online or offline, no matter what the end user license agreement says. The same idea applies to things that aren't technology. If you buy a Mickey Mouse t-shirt, you do not own Mickey Mouse, but you own that particular instance of Mickey Mouse and can sell that, lend it, or even burn it if you wanted to. That instance of Mickey Mouse has been licensed to you. Digital songs, video games, movies, books, they're all goods, not services. And places like the European Union have ruled that software, whether sold via license or not, whether digital or not, is a good and not a service, no matter what the EULA says. In 2016, Australia's High Court determine that video games bought through Steam are goods. Whoever buys a game from Steam becomes the owner of that particular instance of the software that they bought. Canada has also done the same. This issue has not gone to the United States Supreme Court as of writing, but it's fair to believe that if it did get that high, then the verdict would be synonymous with the rest of the world. In 2013, the United States Supreme Court did rule that people in the United States are entitled to resell their copyrighted goods without the copyright holder's permission in accordance with the first sale doctrine. So, why does this myth persist? I firmly believe that it's because digital distributors let it. It sounds strange. Almost counterintuitive even. Wouldn't the idea that Amazon could take away any book or movie that you've ever purchased from them at a moment's notice without your consent make it less appealing to purchase from them in the first place? Well, maybe, if that company wasn't Amazon. Amazon in 2019 is nearly synonymous with online shopping, taking that title away from eBay. Between books, movies, clothes, music, video games, toys, technology, even groceries, 
It's easier to list what you couldn't buy from Amazon rather than the categories of things that you can. This is because Amazon has worked very, very hard to be the Walmart of the internet by employing Walmart's strategies. For years now, Amazon has undercut third-party sellers. They track third-party sales on their platform, and they use that data to sell the most popular items in direct competition with Marketplace members. If you don't buy ebooks from Amazon, where exactly are you going to go to buy them? Especially if you want to put them on your Kindle. Where else are you going to shop? Amazon Prime itself has a wide array of content. This myth helps the big players a lot more than it hurts them. And it helps their competitors as well. Even if you were to buy an ebook from someone else, you'd probably be buying it under the same idea that the software would be licensed and not sold. If you were Amazon, would you want people to think that taking your copies of 1984 and Animal Farm were about on the same level of legality as Barnes & Noble breaking into your house and taking your physical copies of said books? Amazon was actually sued over deleting these books from people. They did offer a new free digital copy as well as a $30 voucher, so a class action wasn't likely. But a high school student and another consumer tried to take them to court. To prevent this from going to court, which would have set a precedent if people truly own their digital copies or not, the case was settled by Amazon for $150,000. Amazon also promised never to repeat its actions under the settlement, with a few conditions. They'll still wipe an ebook if the consumer agrees to have it wiped, if the consumer refused to pay, if it's necessary to protect users from malicious code, or if a regulatory body orders it. So if a government wants to ban a certain work, such as when New Zealand banned Jordan Peterson's book 12 Rules for Life, Amazon will happily comply in removing legally purchased copies from people's libraries. And, even if we're not talking about books that you've already purchased, Amazon has banned several books on their platform. As far as can be told, if you legally purchase something, the retailer has no control over it. The problem is that digital distributors such as Amazon keep acting as if they have control over it. Shows you purchase on Amazon Prime cannot be downloaded on your computer, at least not anymore. You must be connected to the internet to watch what you legally purchased. The only way to get around this restriction is to use a screen capture software. I can't sell what I buy off of Amazon Prime to other people, even other users of Amazon Prime. After a brief grace period, I can't even resell it to Amazon. Keep in mind, in many cases, the physical DVD, where I can do all of these things, costs the same, or even less than the Amazon Prime version. There's an argument that what these digital distributors do is to prevent piracy, and they are well within their rights to create measures to make piracy as difficult as possible. While it's not illegal to rip and burn DVDs for your own personal use, it's not illegal for companies to add copy protection that make it impossible for modern DVD rippers to do just that. That being said, we're in a very strange crossroads. Places like iTunes and Steam were originally created to curb piracy. However, if I were to illegally torrent the software instead of buying it legally, I would have far more control over what I have obtained. For starters, a movie downloaded illegally off the internet can be viewed without an internet connection. And I suppose we should talk about the most pressing question when it comes to digital distributors. As big as Amazon, Apple, and Steam are, what happens when these companies fail and go out of business? That seems unlikely, but I didn't use the word if for a reason. Death of people or corporations is inevitable. Nothing lasts forever. And sooner or later, these companies will go out of business. It's strange, the things that we think that are futuristic, the internet, social media companies, online shopping, they're rarely future-proofed. Right now, the Epic Game Store seems to be challenging Steam's near monopoly on digital games. They've been chasing after many exclusive deals. Games that were once slated to release on Steam will no longer do so due to corporate dealings. Most infamously, the long-awaited Borderlands 3. This has led to a lot of worry when Epic Games bought out the company that made the game Rocket League, Psyonix. Many people became worried that it would become an Epic exclusive, even though Epic Games has stated that the people who bought it on Steam would get consistent updates. Epic doesn't have to do that, though. They can legally only give updates to the people who bought the game on their platform. It'd be easier to do that as well. However, the Epic Games Store has been unscrupulous in other ways. One notable controversy is when their launcher copied a Steam user data file called localconfig.vdf. This saves data, such as your list of games, your friends list, and saved login tokens. It was never meant to be used by other programs or a third-party service. But what would a consumer of Epic Games do about such a consumer abuse? Are they going to abandon Epic Games and everything that they've ever purchased from them? It's not that Steam is perfect. Their near monopoly does allow them to charge hefty percentages to developers on every game sold which can and does increase the price of several titles. And they have far more control over the consumer than they probably should. Legally speaking, you should be able to do things like trade in and sell off your Steam games. That is your property. And it's quite clear that they have the infrastructure that allows their customers to do that, without worrying about the issues that normally come with digital goods. All Steam has to do is just remove the game from your library, as you sell it or trade it in. However, it's against Steam's terms of service to sell games, or access to them, because it would absolutely destroy their business model. We're in a weird situation where these companies have a lot more power and a 
lot of control, more than they reasonably should. But if they should ever fail, we are going to be in a much, much worse situation. Valve has stated that in the unlikely event that they go out of business, you will be able to access all of your Steam games. They'll release a special kind of code that will remove the requirement to have a Steam account to play your games. There are many problems with this solution. Failure is a strange thing, and it could take many forms. It could happen so suddenly, where they won't get a chance to implement this code, or it can happen so gradually that they enter a Catch-22, where entering this code would hurt their currently failing business model, so they keep putting it off more and more, until they're no longer able to do so. How can a company that's going out of business update their services that they most likely can't afford to keep running? People who have had always online requirements have attempted to have release switches, and each and every time, they failed. Generally speaking, when you're in the position when a release switch is required, you're not in the position to release it. When you're in a position when you could use a release switch, doing so would be detrimental to your business venture. So, if you will, allow me to predict the future if we go down this path. If Valve were to go bankrupt, suddenly or not, they either wouldn't want to use this release switch, or they wouldn't be able to. And one day, their servers would just no longer go online. Here's what could potentially happen. Hopefully you were logged into your account, as getting around Steam's password system would be a bit of a challenge. You would still be able to play the games that you had downloaded, but anything else that you purchased, you would not be able to access. They'd be on servers that have been shut down and sold. Some developers would probably want to get people who had purchased their products another copy, so that they could play what they legally purchased. However, most of them would probably want some kind of proof of purchase. If you've had a receipt from that game that you bought five years ago, excellent! If not, good luck getting that proof from your Steam account that you can no longer access. In this scenario, you can't sue anyone. No class action lawsuit, no personal lawsuit. Who are you going to sue? It's not illegal to run out of business. No one person had done anything malicious. It was just an incredible lack of foresight. So 90 million monthly users who have bought products totaling in the billions of dollars have just vanished. A lot of value is just stripped right from the economy. Thousands of games would simply disappear from existence. In this modern day and age, there are a lot of video games that have simply never found their way into physical form. It took something even as big as Minecraft years and years before you could buy it in a physical form. Physical media in general is largely on the way out as digital distributors and streaming services take us further and further away. A lot of it is for the sake of convenience. Why would you buy a $20 CD when you could buy the two songs that you want from it for 99 cents each. People say that a second video game crash couldn't possibly happen, but if Steam goes off the grid, it's safe to say that that would easily create one, the biggest one that we've ever seen. Some people might be able to hack into the Steam client and render it playable, but that's a minor solution that not all of its users are going to be able to do. That's another paradox when it comes to digital distributors. They appeal to the people who can't, or don't want to do the more hardcore work of finding less restrictive goods. And I understand that many of you may not be interested in Steam or video games in general, but you have to keep in mind, it only needs to take one of these big websites to go out of business, and the things that people legally purchase from them to become inaccessible, to create a massive consumer crash. All it takes is one, and the mainstream would be turned off from digital media. People would have seen the wizard behind the curtain. When people stop buying things from a billion dollar industry, that generally leads to recession. It will become disastrous when something like this happens. It's a time bomb that will go off. It Proper precautions are not made, like now. Let's get out of the realm of speculation and go back into our modern day. Have you tried deleting your Apple, your Steam, or your Amazon accounts? I wouldn't imagine that you would have, because that'd be a very foolish thing to do. If you leave their platform, then you lose literally everything that you purchase from them. While they aren't as ban happy as Twitter or Facebook, this does pose a very frightening affect. The longer that you have an account, the more that you're intertwined with it, and the harder it is to get out. Not that you can actually cancel your Amazon account yourself. The methods to do so are very hidden on their website, and it can actually only be done on your end after having a conversation with an Amazon employee. Once a site like Amazon has you, it's more likely than not that they have you forever. And that might not be a good thing. Digital distributors thus far have not been very ban happy, which is a good thing. Could you imagine if Amazon decided to get political? If they didn't like your speech and threatened to delete your account and everything that you've ever purchased from them? Right now, Amazon is only focused on banning books and not people. Some people have digital goods totaling in the thousands of dollars through iTunes Music, through Amazon Prime purchases, through Steam games, and a loss of that would be absolutely devastating. Blocking your account is not illegal, but removing all of your digital goods from you most likely is. It's the difference between being banned from a store and the store owner deciding to take back everything that you've ever purchased from them. However, these digital storefronts have shown that they do have the means to do something like that. Just because shooting me is illegal doesn't mean that I want someone aiming a gun at me. And right now, Amazon, Steam, iTunes, they're all aiming a gun at their consumers. And this is especially worrying because bugs have been known to 
crop up. And all of what I said doesn't just apply to digital goods anymore. You see, companies like Apple continually make their real-world devices less user-friendly, whether by intention or by accident. Did you know that taking your MacBook to a local repairer or anyone that's in an Apple store could render the thing inoperative? They have a special Apple T2 chip, which requires certain tools to repair, and those tools are secret software owned by Apple. This is required to repair the display, the logic board, the touch bar, the keyboard, the battery, the trackpad, and the speakers. The company released an update that managed to break iPhone 7 and iPhone 7 Plus units that had their screen replaced with third-party components. It is completely within their rights as a company to change their software to become more user-unfriendly. Any tech company is allowed to do this. It's just as legal as removing a headphone jack. After all, it's not illegal for you personally to jailbreak your phone and escape these malicious updates. And it would be very, very hard to make a law that made it illegal for companies to update things that you had already purchased. Think how that would affect MMOs like World of Warcraft if the people behind the game could never, ever update what people legally purchased from them. It just appears that tech companies are one of the few industries that seems to be actively at war with its consumers. And it is definitely unlikely to become illegal. Think of a more benevolent usage of this functionality. Updates like these also tend to come along to prevent malicious code or to patch holes in security leaks. And the people who aren't likely to know how to jailbreak their phones are the kind of people who would most likely need those kind of benevolent updates. And think of something like an MMO, like World of Warcraft. It would be very, very strange to ask them to never update something that people have already legally purchased. If you want to prevent this kind of thing from happening, all you need to do is go to a competitor that's more trustworthy and won't try to break your devices when you don't play by their rules. It's strange that a company, which once ran an ad about fighting against a 1984 dystopian future, has decided that they want to become in the possession of that dystopian government. Not that they're the only ones. Amazon and Google have released digital assistants, Echo and Home respectively. These devices are always listening. After all, they have to be to function properly. Their wake words can be set at any time. Both companies have filed patent applications for algorithms that let their devices monitor more of what users say and do. The information obtained could be used to identify a person's desires or interests, which could be mined for product recommendations. Google outlines how audio and visual signals could be used to determine a speaker's mood or medical condition. Both companies have stated that privacy is of a very high concern to them. Unfortunately, as we've established in the Facebook episode, it's not up to the company what happens to your data. The government can subpoena anything that they save. It must be understood that these companies are not benevolent, nor should they be expected to be. The only thing that a company should be expected to do is make a product that they advertise and to make as much money as they possibly could. Even if a company could be considered benevolent, hacking attempts are made all all the time. It'd be really bad if, say, a foreign government got access to all of this information. Now wouldn't it? It's not like companies haven't already been malicious towards their consumers. In 2018, the California Farmers Lobbying Group signed away farmers' rights to access or modify the source code of any farm equipment or software that they owned. Because of this, farmers cannot change engine settings, retrofit old equipment, or even modify their tractors to meet new environmental standards. They have to get specialty repairs by the company that owns the software. It could take days for a repairer to get them, in an industry where every day is vital. If there's a group of people that you do not want to mess with, I would assume they would have to be farmers. These are the people who grow the food that we need to live, that our livestock needs to live, and food that becomes a valuable export. If tech companies are willing to exploit one of the most important jobs out there, as long as humans still have the need to eat, what do you think that says about the rest of us? I personally don't think the digital distributors are going to want to censor us like Facebook or Twitter. I think what they're going to do is what we're more used to big corporations doing. They're going to become increasingly user hostile, make things a lot more difficult for the user to do what they want to do, and try to erode more and more consumer rights. And they'll have leverage too. When it comes to a traditional brick and mortar store like Walmart, if you find what they're doing reprehensible, you could just shop somewhere else. However, if you were to leave to Amazon Prime or Steam, you would have to leave everything that you ever bought from them. And there generally isn't much competition. There really isn't another service like Amazon Prime at present. And any competitors that do exist have the same issues. And the longer that you use these services, the harder that it becomes to leave them. The harder that it becomes to leave them, the more power that they have over you, the consumer. In this video, I will have to talk about some very controversial people. What I said in the Twitter episode still applies here, doubly so. I want to remind people that just because I talk about or even object to how people are treated does not mean that I endorse their opinions or actions. One comment that frequently appeared on my Twitter segment was that freedom of speech does not mean freedom of consequence. That is true, but every action or word does not deserve every single consequence. Just as I can believe that the death penalty is wrong and murderers should be punished, I can believe that the opinions and actions held by the people in this video are wrong, but their treatment was the incorrect course of action.
the past few years, YouTube has made it more and more difficult to make a living for a wide variety of people. A large swath of them have been deemed not advertiser friendly. Some of the people delisted were genuinely offensive and awful people taking advantage of YouTube systems to be hateful or commit copyright infringement. However, along the way, several other types of people had been affected. Some of them were independent news creators that got demonetized whenever they talked about a touchy subject. Some of them were comedians who told less politically correct material. And some of them were social commentators that had unpopular opinions. One saving grace for many of these people that appeared to bubble up beneath the surface was the website Patreon. Patreon is a crowdfunding service that was specifically made to help with these fears. Previous crowdfunding sites like Indiegogo or Kickstarter or GoFundMe forced their users to have some kind of end goal, a product that they wanted to make, for instance. Patreon was designed to be more ongoing. With Patreon donations, there was no end goal. Users could determine if people would donate after every project, or after every month, and there are pros and cons to both settings. In the years since Patreon was founded in 2013, it became a reprieve for YouTubers and other internet content creators that had concerns over free speech. It attracted a wide variety of people, from the far left to the far right. People of all types had created Patreon accounts, and the site seemed to be largely neutral when it came to the online politicking that you'd see on sites like Facebook or Twitter. This reputation changed in July of 2017. The first high-profile banning of a Patreon account was that of Lauren Southern of Rebel Media. Rebel Media is a far-right conservative news platform, but that's not what got their account banned. Lauren's account and several others were banned for interrupting a search and rescue ship in the Mediterranean during the migrant crisis. According to Jack Conti, the CEO of Patreon, this counted as something that he dubbed as Manifest Observable Behavior, or MOB. Everything to do with a concept called Manifest Observable Behavior. The purpose of using Manifest Observable Behavior is to remove personal values and beliefs when the team is reviewing content. It's a review method that's entirely based on observable facts. What has a camera seen? What has an audio device recorded? It doesn't matter what your intentions are, your motivations, who you are, your identity, your ideology. The Trust and Safety team only looks at Manifest Observable Behavior. We get rigorous and specific because we're talking about removing a person's income, the authority to take away a human being's income is a sobering responsibility. In this video, Jack goes on to describe what methods and standards that he and the company Patreon has when it comes to removing people from the platform. Lauren was removed because, according to Jack Conti, she was taking action or threatening to take action that could lead to harm. Jack Conti defines manifest observable behavior as actions that a camera can see and hear. He goes on describing this as it not mattering why you're doing this particular action. You can't use manifest observable behavior to say who someone is. That's just a more nebulous claim. You can use manifest observable behavior to say what someone did or didn't do, and whether or not those things are or are not against your content policy. Jack Conti also notes that there is a distinction between credible threats and non-credible threats. Lauren Southern's actions were deemed as credible harm to others. Some people liked the standard, and some people hated the standard and critiqued Patreon harshly for this. But either way, Patreon had set forth a standard on who they would remove from their platform. Personally speaking, I am not against Patreon being able to ban people they consider dangerous or destructive. However, when you do make a standard like this, you do open yourself up to scrutiny. As we've established with Tumblr, it can be impossible to hold such rigorous standards for everyone. There are several Antifa groups that have Patreon pages. If you don't know, this group has been responsible for many domestic terror attacks, and both the FBI and Homeland Security have warned as such. For what it's worth, I do respect Patreon's standard. Patreon should not help in funding what could amount to real-world crimes and the actual danger of individuals. Actions that cause damage to people or violate the law should not be supported through a platform like Patreon. If people do slip through the cracks, well, that's only the reality of the internet. Let's call out these people as we find them. However, let's move away from talking about actions and talk more about the words that have gotten people banned from Patreon. Carl Benjamin is a YouTuber, better known as Sargon of Akkad, who is known for critiquing social justice and other concepts usually held by the left and the far left, and he has been a very controversial person. He had been on Patreon for four years, when he was banned without warning. What had happened is that activists had located a podcast. In this podcast, Sargon was debating members of the alt-right, and he used the n-word against them several times. There are a few issues with this entire scenario. The first is that this podcast was not a part of Sargon's Patreon persona. The podcast was not his. It was not uploaded to his YouTube channel. It is also not real-world manifest observable behavior. As far as I could tell, the N-word, even said by a person who isn't black, is not against the rules of Patreon, as there have been many other people who have used that particular word in a wide variety of circumstances. Patreon later claimed that Sargon had done so many collaborations and debates that these had become a part of his Patreon persona. However, that criteria is very vague, nebulous, and incredibly subject to change. 
There are many people who are still on Patreon that use their platforms specifically to debate other people, and these are people who may be considered very controversial. It is also not up to Patreon as to what determines someone's Patreon persona, as any individual can choose whether or not to alert their Patreons of each work or collaboration that they've done, even if they choose to be funded every single month instead of after every single work. To most outside observers, this appeared like a very selective enforcing of the rules. Sargon was banned for something that he did not do or support with Patreon as a platform, no matter what way you cut it. Even if you hate Sargon, and you hate what he did, you do have to ask yourself if you want the standard to apply. That no matter what you do, anywhere else, you have the ability to get removed from Patreon, which is a substantial portion of many people's income. Remember, it doesn't have to be Jack Conti in charge, it could be anyone with any morals that they choose. This happened after Jack Conti stated on the Dave Rubin podcast that such a thing would not happen. He stated that what you do on Patreon is what you get banned for on Patreon. And when we talk about payment processors like Patreon, we have to keep in mind, this isn't the same thing as getting a Twitter account blocked. Patreon is income. Income is what people need to survive. And banning someone's Patreon account can very much lead them into destitution. In Patreon terms of service, they do state that they can ban you for harming Patreon as a brand. This means that simply critiquing them like this video does means that my Patreon account is at risk. Technically speaking, sharing this video puts Patreon accounts at risk. There's a reason that nobody reads EULAs. Their language is so vague and nebulous that they mean literally anything that there is no point to reading them. The podcast that Sargon was banned for, it happened 10 months before he was removed from the platform. And it wasn't like Sargon was not a controversial person before this banning, or before this incident, or even before he signed up to Patreon, four years prior. Sargon's very persona is attacking concepts of political correctness. Nothing about Sargon's presence on Patreon had changed before or after this incident. And applying something that somebody had done 10 months ago on a whim is by any standard a miscarriage of justice. If it was truly that egregious what he had done, why was he not banned more immediately? Yes, Patreon is a private company and they can ban whoever they wish. After all, freedom of speech does not mean freedom of consequences. However, censorship also has consequences, and sometimes they could be far, far worse than allowing a controversial person on your platform. Removing Sargon from Patreon has had wide-reaching costs that has not just affected Patreon as a company, but it has affected many of the people who rely on Patreon for an income. Many people across the board found their Patreon income severely down, and this is for a variety of reasons. Firstly, many people quit right out of protest. These weren't just random people either. High-profile people left the platform with Patreon accounts totaling in the tens of thousands of dollars per month. This included Sam Harris, a person who was one of the top 10 biggest Patreon accounts at the time. A lot of Patreon supporters also had vanished when this happened. Many of the people were there primarily to support people like Sargon or Sam Harris, and just gave to other creators with their extras. When their primary reason for staying on the platform vanished, so did these people. These people tended to be the one or two dollar donators, which make up the lifeblood of most people's Patreons. This one banning affected so many people who had never heard of Sargon, and didn't care about him at all. And that's just how the story begins. In the month afterward, Patreon was not able to pay their users for a few days. Patreon has also gone on record stating that its business model is not sustainable as it sees rapid growth, even though it appears that rapid growth is not currently happening. Both of these instances are very confusing to me. Logically, what Patreon, PayPal, or any other payment processor does should not be expensive. What they do is move digital numbers from one account to another, and take a cut of it as they do so. This can be done in less than a second, at no more than the cost of the electricity required to run the computers. A few months after this, in May of 2019, Patreon decided to create a new standard. Anyone who created an account after May 6th of 2019 would end up needing to give Patreon a larger cut of their income. Older accounts would not be affected, but this is most likely to stop further trouble and further rebellion. You see, there actually is a downside of being a private company, and no, they can't just do whatever they want. Investors tend to expect infinite growth when it comes to these companies. And if you do something like ban someone as popular as Sargon was on very weak arguments, it affects your image. And more importantly, it affects your bottom line. It gets the investors very angry. And Patreon dealt with this controversy very poorly. Some of the worst that I've ever seen a big website deal with the controversy. After this incident, several YouTubers reported on the Sargon banning, including Tim Pool and Matt Christensen. They both ended up getting replies from Patreon. Literally, they got calls on the phone. And this was completely unsolicited. They did not ask for a phone call. Meanwhile, Patreon as a company would not respond to Sargon, the person on trial, even through email. On the phone call Tim Pool had, he brought up several examples of other people who had not been banned, despite doing exactly what Sargon did. However, the Patreon representative stated that they could not comment on other private accounts, while specifically going out of their way to talk to him about a private account. Matt Christensen's call was with a representative from Patreon's Trust and Safety Council, Jacqueline Hart. Preceding this call, she had specifically asked if he was recording before they began any proceedings, and she asked about this several times. Matt said that he wasn't recording, and technically he wasn't. 
month. Matt was transcribing the conversation, and this is why we have evidence of what was spoken during this phone call. Each of these segments of the discussion had significant revelations, but none more significant to me than three primary ones. First, that explicitly, by Jacqueline's description, Patreon is not a free speech platform. Second, that explicitly, by Jacqueline's description, Patreon is not a free market. And third, explicitly, by Jacqueline's description, rules enforcement on Patreon is subjective by design. If you take nothing else away from this video, I want you to remember those three things. What Jacqueline says is both telling and confusing, as well as very chilling. The transcript of the call is fascinating in the worst possible ways. Jacqueline has stated that to accomplish the mission of Patreon, they have to build a community of creators that are comfortable sharing a platform, and if they allow certain types of speech that, quote unquote, some people would call free speech, then only creators who use Patreon that don't mind their branding being associated with that kind of speech would be those that that use Patreon. I want to make a side note here. This statement is incredibly fallacious when it comes to a place as large as an internet platform like Patreon, and I'm getting annoyed that's an argument that keeps coming up, that certain people or products must be removed because their competitors do not want to share a platform with something of disrepute. This is also an argument that comes up whenever a controversial game makes it to Steam, such as the game Active Shooter. It was a game that would let you play as a school shooter. There is an argument that more reputable people would actually like a game like that as competition. If the consumer had a choice between my game, for instance, or one about playing as a school shooter, if those were the two games next to each other on a shelf, generally speaking, people would go to my game because the competitor was being so blatantly distasteful. It works the same way with people. If there are incredibly controversial people on your platform, they generally will not attract the people who are actually respectable. Respectable people will choose more respectable items and more respectable people. Items or people that are disgusting in some way, shape, or form tend to only get popularity because you turn the controversy and spotlight onto them. The forbidden fruit effect is a very real thing, and it's another reason why censorship doesn't work. Jacqueline Hart has stated that Patreon has to be especially harsh on people who use slurs against people with marginalized identities. Twitter's representative said something similar on the Joe Rogan podcast, where they specifically need to go out of their way to ban certain types of language, specifically insults based on identity. On places like Twitter, you are far more likely to get banned if you call someone by a slur than you are if you were to give out a death threat. Their logic is that these people of marginalized identities need extra protections to be able to use the platform. The issue with this kind of attitude is that it can and has been seen as sexist, racist, and of other kinds of prejudice by both the left and the right. The right calls it the bigotry of low expectations. The logic goes like this. People in the majority class are expected to be strong enough to deal with the insults based on their identity. By saying that minorities need special attention in this regard, you are saying that they are emotionally weaker than the people in the majority. People on the left call this white savior syndrome, that you think that you are better than these minorities and you need to be their defender. Part of this portion of the conversation was also about some sort of ambiguous pressure Jacqueline says payment processors are applying to Patreon to keep them in line. This part of Matt's video is absolutely fascinating to me. After Sargon was banned from Patreon, he went to a Patreon competitor, Subscribestar. Within a week after Sargon joined Subscribestar, PayPal dropped support of the platform nearly killing it. For most people caught in the crossfire, it appeared very much that the buck did not stop at Patreon. The removal of Subscribestar from PayPal services happened so quickly that to many it felt like collusion. In fact, one YouTuber, YouTuber Law, who documents ongoing tech cases having to do with things like this, began preparing a lawsuit to get this declared as collusion. I am going to say this right now. If there is anything that scares me in making this documentary, it is talking about the sins of payment processors. The only thing that scared me more than not talking about them was, well, leaving the power that these companies have unchecked and not called out on. In short, companies like PayPal and Patreon are what inspired technocracy as a documentary. Science fiction writers often imagined a cashless society where people wouldn't use money. They'd just use a card or some other identification like a fingerprint. We are very close to such a society now, it seems. About a decade ago, it wasn't a rare sight to see a store that wouldn't take credit or debit. Nowadays, the inverse is much more common. There exist many stores that won't accept physical cash, especially in big cities. They'll only accept debit or credit. And what would you expect when more than 90% of the world's currency is digital? When you get banned from Twitter, what happens? You get cut away from the conversation and you may lose a following. However, that can still be gotten through other means, even if there is only one Twitter. What happens if you get banned from YouTube? Worst case scenario, you have lost your job. It's unfortunate, but being fired does happen in the real world. It isn't too far out of the norm, for better or for worse. What happens if you get banned from somewhere like PayPal? Many goods and services on the internet only serve through PayPal, or it's 
only competitor Stripe. What I say about PayPal also applies to Stripe. They are of the same Stripe, if you will, and it is the very real definition of a duopoly. PayPal is the means of which I personally pay both my artists and my editors. If I got banned from YouTube, I'd be able to survive, but getting locked from my PayPal account would be damning. It is one of the only ways to transfer wealth to people that are not businesses. I mean, you could give people your credit card number and your bank information, but that would be a stupid idea, for obvious reasons. But you have to keep in mind, even though we use PayPal to transfer wealth, PayPal is just as much a private company as Twitter, and they are just as able to ban people as Twitter, or in Subscribestar's case, entire businesses. Many internet models rely on PayPal. The people who have been banned by PayPal do tend to be of the nastier sort. They ban both the Proud Boys and Antifa. One group is far right and the other group is far left, but they're not the only people that PayPal have banned or have the ability to ban. Subscribestar was a neutral party. Before it was abandoned by PayPal, no one had heard of the platform. From an outside perspective, it looked like they just banned Subscribestar because Sargon was on it. This means that not only are they attacking the freedom of speech, but the freedom of association, which is far, far scarier. If these companies don't like who you are talking to, who you are associating with, they can cut you off. And that kind of power is frightening at any regard. When people with a certain political view get banned, what happens is that what becomes acceptable shrinks further than what is expected. There will always be a most offensive person on your platform. There will always be a craziest person. PayPal has banned Alex Jones, and they've gotten themselves sued in the process. Even if he was gone, that only leaves room for the next Alex Jones, the next conspiracy theorist. There will always be one. Maybe you can get rid of this kind of behavior on a platform like Twitter. That's because not everyone needs to use Twitter, but virtually everyone needs to spend money. You cannot function in a society, in adult life, without spending money. This is a need that people of the far left, the far right, and everywhere in between has to do. And do you know what happens when someone can't do something as simple as exchange wealth in a society? These people will become excluded from society. That definitely seems to be the goal of removing them from a platform like PayPal. But when people become excluded from society, they don't go away, they become more and more radical. What happens when you take away every single one of a person's op? What would you do if you were suddenly no longer able to access your bank? Your only options then and there would be to either cause trouble or starve to death. And the people who are getting banned from these platforms will almost certainly fall into the former camp. It's frightening. And that's no exaggeration, because the buck does not stop with PayPal either. Things get worse. Credit cards and banks are the next rung on this ladder. Chase Bank has been closing accounts since 2013, starting with sex workers. They stated that they had a morality clause in their account agreement. Chase Bank canceled the mortgage refinancing process for someone who had a company that made softcore pornography films, which is not illegal in the United States. It was a legal business that they banned. Chase Bank has also banned dispensaries of medical marijuana and a woman-owned condom manufacturing company. They stated that processing sales for adult-oriented products was a quote-unquote reputational risk, even though Chase Bank was doing business with places like drugstores, which were selling very similar products. And by very similar, I mean exactly the same. And yes, in 2019, they banned online personalities such as the chairman of the Proud Boys and Martina Marcota. They have not given a reason for these bannings. Maybe the bannings were justified? I don't know, and I can't tell you. It should be highly illegal to close a bank account without giving a very clear reason as to why it was closed. I don't care whose bank you're closing. Then there's the credit card companies. Visa and MasterCard have taken action to ban cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. They have classified the industry as high risk. Keep in mind, when it comes to criticisms of big banks in the credit card industry, one of the things that you'll hear first and most often is that you need to invest in cryptocurrency. And cryptocurrency is one of the few ways to exchange wealth on the internet without going through the banks or payment processors. Whether you invest in cryptocurrency, that is your own choice. It should be your own choice. It's not my choice. And it definitely shouldn't be Visa or MasterCard's choice either. Recently, an activist group that some of us has forced MasterCard to hold a vote that would essentially create a trust and safety council on MasterCard's service, similar to the ones that we've seen on Twitter and Patreon. It will undoubtedly catch bad people who are using the service in inhumane ways. It will catch racists, sexists, and more. It will also catch people who end up becoming unpopular. Imagine what Twitter's cancel culture could do when it has sway over credit card companies. Even if you want to stop all the prejudices in the world, this is not the way to do it. Credit cards work for a similar reason that money does. When you accept a dollar bill, you can be reasonably sure that it is a real exchange of wealth, even though, yes, it 
is a piece of paper that is backed by very little. You can be reasonably sure that anyone you give it to will agree on its value. And the United States government can't just say, no, your dollar bills do not work. Credit cards do not change this dynamic. Ones and zeros on a computer screen actually have less real world value than a piece of paper, which can at least be burned for warmth. The only difference is that the credit card company can say, your dollar bills do not work, even though they probably shouldn't. If you take away a credit card or debit card's reliability for one person, you take away its reliability for everyone. The only reason that PayPal, MasterCard, or Chase Bank should be banning people from their platforms is if they are accessories to committing an actual legal crime. And even then, it's tricky because a criminal paying for something with a debit or a credit card has just left a wealth of evidence that will get them convicted. This works the same with banks as well. Banks only work because an average person can be reasonably certain that they will have the money that they put into it. When people aren't certain about this, then banks do not work. And when what we use as currency cannot be reasonably expected to function, do you know what happens? Bad things happen. Economic turmoil is the least of concerns. Society breaks down. Even if you think that Twitter or Facebook can and should ban whoever they like because they're private companies, you have to put your foot down here with these private companies. The people that have been banned in many cases I find Awful, but this is not the right punishment. Not by a long shot. If someone has committed a crime, they get to see their date in court and are given a punishment that a single arbiter, a judge, grants them after hearing the whole case with them present. They have rights involved in this. PayPal or MasterCard private companies do not need to do this. They can ban you and exclude you from a large part of the economy because they do not like your opinions or for any other reasons that they don't even need to give you. And they can do this forever. Lifetime imprisonment only happens in very rare circumstance. Why is lifetime banning from some of the biggest, most important social media sites the most common kind of banning there is? When you assume that people can never, ever change, you are condemning them to just that. Never, ever changing except becoming more awful, more radical people. These bannings sound like they should be very illegal. That leads to the very obvious question. Why hasn't the United States government intervened with the credit card companies or the banks? Well, the reason for that is that this is where the buck stops with the United States government. In 2013, the United States Department of Justice launched an initiative called Operation Choke Point. Under this operation, banks would investigate certain businesses. It was originally targeted at payday lenders, but expanded to firearm dealers and other companies believed to be at a higher risk for fraud or money laundering. The idea was to choke off the oxygen for businesses that were exploiting customers. Banks were told by the FDIC that they should consider a quote-unquote reputational risk in their banking relations if they were to do business in fields such as pornography. Does that sound familiar? Lawful industries were targeted by this initiative. Here's a source that I had to pull off internet's Wayback Machine because it had been removed from oversight.house.gov for a reason that I do not know. Operation Choke Point was designed to choke out high-risk businesses, despite the fact that these businesses were legal. And it was a wide variety of industries, too, without much regard for what they actually were. No one standard includes all of these categories. Some of the things targeted were Ponzi schemes and racist materials, but thrown in were coin dealers and telemarketing. Dating services and travel clubs were targeted. And we are still seeing the effects of this, even though the operation was ended in 2017. And if you're wondering, this was very much illegal for the government to do. In 2010, the Supreme Court ruled that the First Amendment protected the right of corporations and unions to spend money on political speech in Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. It was a controversial ruling, but as can be extrapolated, in the United States, at least for now, spending money is a form of speech, which should be constitutionally protected. Before I started this, I had the belief that the biggest issue was the PayPal Stripe duopoly. And that is definitely a massive problem, one of the biggest problems on the internet. If you're transferring wealth on the internet, you have to go through at least one of them in most cases, unless you give out your bank details, which you absolutely should not do or invest in cryptocurrency, which is risky, even if you know exactly what you're doing. And Visa and MasterCard have attempted to ban it. I thought that the United States government would be a solution here, as they probably should have some kind of means for any of its citizens to exchange wealth between its other citizens. But if the United States government is willing to do something as brazen as this, they're obviously not the solution either. At this point, the wisest option might be to just put your money under your mattress. <laughs>
Don't be evil. We believe strongly that in the long term, we will be better served, as shareholders and in all other ways, by a company that does good things for the world, even if we forego some short-term gains. Google users trust our systems to help them with important decisions, medical, financial, and many others. Our search results are the best we know how to produce. They are unbiased and objective, and we do not accept payment for them or for inclusion or more frequent updating. We believe it is important for everyone to have access to the best information in research, not only to the information that people pay for you to see. A letter from Google's founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin detailing Google's motto, don't be evil. What is evil? Well, many acts can be described as evil. Theft, revenge, tyranny, inducing suffering, and selfishness. But that is to do evil, that is not evil in and of itself. Evil, in my opinion, is willingly harming others for your own personal benefit. That is what I describe as evil. I think that most others would agree with that definition. Don't be evil. It sounds like it should be a simple task, especially for one of the most powerful entities in the world. Google isn't just one of the most powerful companies in the world. Google, and by extent its parent company Alphabet, have more power than some countries. The term Google has grown past just a brand name. It is so culturally ubiquitous that to Google something is a verb that most in the English-speaking world do understand. Words like Google have appeared in many other languages too. Sweden even had an official word, o Google bar, which translates to ungoogleable. However, the definition was something that was o Google bar could not be searched on any web-based search engine. And because of this, Google threatened litigation against the Swedish government in 2013. Google's lawyers wanted this term to only refer to Google and not to any of their competitors, so they sued the country of Sweden. For the first time in history, the Language Council of Sweden removed a word from its lexicon. It's hard to think of another entity on Earth, person, company, government, that can rival Google in terms of sheer power. So that leads to the very obvious question. How powerful is Google exactly? That's hard to quantify. They say that knowledge is power, and a Google search for anything nets you 2.2 billion responses in under a second. But let's start small. What does Google know about you? personally. Every time that you turn your phone on, Google stores your location. If you really wanted to, you could see a timeline of where you've been from the first time you started using Google on your phone. Google knows everything that you've ever searched, even if you deleted your search history, even if you use incognito mode. Google has an advertisement profile, which includes your location, your gender, age, hobbies, career, interests, and in some cases, your weight. Google obviously knows your sexuality. Google knows a lot of the apps and extensions that you use. They know your YouTube history. The data that Google has collected on me, personally, and this account that I've been using since 2013 contained 148.93 gigabytes of data, and it took 16 hours for them to compile it. Not send it to me, compile it into folders. It consisted of 67 zip files. Google can access your webcam and your microphone. Google knows more about you than your friends, your family, and even more than you know about yourself. Usually this information is for targeted ads, which get more and more advanced every single year. The store brand Target was able to figure out that a teen girl was pregnant and sent her coupons for infant care supplies before she or her family knew that she was pregnant. This was back in 2012. Moore's Law states that the speed and capability of computers can be expected to double every two years, and we are seven years away from this event and Google has continually sought more and more information from its users. Google Plus, when it was first established, required users to log in with their full name, first and last. And when people didn't want to do that, they integrated the service with YouTube against user protest and required people to sign up to Google Plus in order to comment on YouTube videos. This wasn't the first time that something like this had happened. Google Plus was a competitor to Facebook. In 2010, Google had launched their competitor to Twitter, Google Buzz. Their idea was to merge Twitter, something they used to speak publicly, with email, something they used to speak to people in private, which was just a recipe for disaster. When you first logged into Google Buzz, you were automatically set up with followers and people to follow. This was chosen based on the people you emailed and chatted with the most using Gmail. And these were made public to anyone who looked at your profile by default. Imagine if you were thinking of joining another company and you've been frequently emailing your new potential employer. Well, thanks to Google Buzz, your current employer gets to know this. If a person was in an abusive relationship and was talking to friends who were trying to help them out of it, or even just to cope, the abuser could easily know thanks to Google Buzz. In the United States, it's illegal to read someone else's mail. Opening someone's mail intentionally comes with a $250,000 fine and up to five years in federal prison. We do expect emails to have the same kind of protections. They do not. To be fair, Google has stopped using the contents of your emails on Gmail to personalize ads. According to Google, no one at Gmail reads your Gmail, except in very specific cases, like where they need to for security purposes. You know, like how the TSA exists for security purposes, despite never catching a terrorist. As far as I can tell, it is not illegal for them to read your 
your emails, or data mine them, or use them for whatever purpose that they choose. Even if it was, it doesn't really matter. One subpoena and all of this belongs to the government, or it could belong to another government if they were to access this information through some means like hacking. Maybe this information could belong to generic hackers. If anyone gets a password to your Google account, they have access to your entire life story. Everything you do, you think, you are. Whether Google is good or evil is irrelevant. Google has taken the genie out of the bottle and it belongs to whoever can claim it. But Google has vowed to not be evil. And as we all know, a company that buys a military robot developer cannot be evil. If you don't like this invasion of your privacy, it's simple. Just do what you do when you don't like any other brand or company. Just don't use Google. That sounds simple, right? It's not. Google Chrome is the most popular web browser. Gmail is the most popular email service in the world. And not only is Google the number one search engine in the world, it is the most viewed website on the entire internet, with an Alexa rating of 1. And the Google-owned YouTube is number 2. About a third of the top 50 websites belong to Google. Google Hong Kong, Japan, UK, India, Brazil, Germany, and Russia are all in the top 50. And Google France is currently number 51 in Alexa ratings. Google is literally 40% of the internet, and what you do on the internet is largely at their mercy. Just because you're not using Google doesn't mean that your potential customers aren't. Google controls what people can see. During 2017's Florida school shooting, Google decided to ban shopping searches that included the term gun in them. This bypassed the law, and it bypassed sellers. The algorithm was so strict that it ended up giving error notices when people searched for glue guns, water guns, toy guns, airsoft guns, nail guns, nerf guns, and even searches that included burgundy, or the anime Gundam Wing. It also affected bands like Velvet Revolver and the Sex Pistols, because they were just so brazen about it. You see, Google has the power to act like the Mafia. During a hearing before a Senate antitrust panel in 2011, Jeremy Stoppelman, the chief of Yelp, said that sites like his have to cooperate with Google because it is the gateway to so many users. About a half of Yelp's visitors come through a Google search. Google is very good at undercutting competition. YouTube exists at a loss. It doesn't make a profit and it's not designed to. What it does is make it impossible for another video streaming platform to come up. How do you offer uploads as fast as YouTube's, with as much space as YouTube's, as reliable as YouTube's, for free, while advertisers become flightier and flightier? The answer is you run it at a loss. Anyone else who tries to make a platform as technically sound as YouTube will fail. Vanilla is just the most recent victim of this, but any other site that tries to directly compete with YouTube will fail because it cannot sustain a profit. Firefox and Chrome have both banned gaps to center app within hours of each other, and the two of them combined have a 75% share of the web browser market. The center was a platform that was meant to essentially add comment sections to anything on the internet. If a YouTube video had removed comments, for instance, the app would allow people to comment on it anyway. This was all the app did. It's been having a difficult history because it's made by Gab. The New Zealand government banned this app after the Christchurch shooting, even though this app was not at all involved with the Christchurch shooting. The shooting was live streamed to Facebook, and it was posted to Facebook over one million times. Decenter was removed from the Chrome Web Store for quote-unquote violent or bullying behavior. According to the message that was sent to Gab, it read, Depictions of gratuitous violence are not allowed. Apps should not contain materials that threaten, harass, or bully others. All it did was allow users to comment on posts. If Decenter falls under that umbrella, comment sections in general fall under that umbrella. And this is even ignoring that, according to many media outlets, the Google Play Store is packed with nasty, violent games that are aimed at children. These include wide swaths of copyright infringement, microtransaction gambling, and disturbing imagery. No matter how many news outlets complain about this, Google does very little about them. You will, on any given day, be able to find a large swath of these things in the Google Play Store. In fact, on YouTube, we actually had a viral hoax. It was called Momo. It all started with viral pictures of a creepy Japanese statue. The story was that this was Momo, and it appeared in various videos telling kids to hurt or even kill themselves. They dubbed it the Momo challenge. However, it was largely a hoax fueled by media outrage and trolls trying to capitalize on fear. YouTube themselves have stated that they've seen no evidence of videos promoting this challenge, and the mere mention of it could easily get a video demonetized. The fear elevated into public consciousness, even though it wasn't real, it was based on a hoax. Do you know what was real though? An app based on the animated children's television show Blaze and the Monster Machine. It was meant to look as official as possible, and when you downloaded it, it threatened to stab people. Very few media outlets actually reported on this, or any of the other hundreds, possibly thousands of apps that are laden with viruses, disturbing content, and egregious copyright infringement. This was one of the many apps in between doing dentistry or surgery on kids' cartoon characters like Elsa or Patrick Starr, asset flips, 
and games that try to look as much as possible like official properties by Nintendo or other video game companies, even though they are not endorsed or licensed. However, on the Google-owned YouTube, when a media outlet complains about exactly the same content, or even lighter content, things change and they change rapidly. This was known as the Adpocalypse. Advertisers decided to pull out when it was discovered that their material was appearing on disturbing content, and Google decided to appease them for a reason that I cannot truly understand. As reported in 2017, Facebook and Google alone control 85% of the online ad growth. If you advertise on the internet, chances are that you advertise through AdSense. If you don't, where else are you going to go? A company that has as many controversies as Facebook? In the power dynamic, Google is completely at the top. Even if the big advertisers left the platform like YouTube, Google could outlast them, and it is one of the few companies that is more powerful than the advertisers that it keels to. By allowing disturbing children's apps, it says something about Google as a company, doesn't it? What seems to happen is that when the advertisers get into a panic, it's largely a bluff. It would be completely stupid to abandon a site like Google or YouTube permanently. Remember, they are the top two websites on the internet. There is no reason not to advertise there, unless you're bluffing to get a better deal. Google and YouTube most likely endorse this because they probably are not hurt in this transaction. In my speculation, they do what most big companies do, and they send on the savings to their customers. The more and more YouTubers who get demonetized, the less of a hit that Google as a company needs to take, and the lower that the advertisers have to pay. It's a win-win for everyone except for the content creators. Think about it. Google can just decide that your company does not appear in search rankings, whether it be a nobody like Jerry's Towing or a big name like Coca-Cola. In 2014, the publisher of the website Coastnews.com filed a lawsuit against Google, alleging three violations of California antitrust law. What he had done was post a news article about a nudist colony. Allegedly, Google warned Martin to remove what they alleged pornographic material within three days. Even after Martin did so, the website Coastnews.com was removed as a top result from Google search results, and they were given other consequences. In this case, it was ruled that Google has a First Amendment right to control search results. They essentially argued that it is their freedom of speech to determine what you can and cannot see on their platform. Websites like Twitter have also argued the same. Keep in mind, this is a company where a large group of employees complained of the term family-friendly. When a Google executive used the term family-friendly when talking about a product for children, one employee became so upset that the word family was used to refer to household with children. That employee determined that this was offensive, inappropriate, and wrong. This kind of attitude has repeatedly been seen in stories coming out of Google. In 2017, an engineer named James Damore published a paper entitled Google's Ideological Echo Chamber, which unleashed a firestorm of controversy. It was branded as a quote-unquote anti-diversity screed. The Guardian even charitably used the headline James Damore on his autism and the Google memo. So what does the document say? The TLDR, which is a term that is actually used within the document itself, states that Google's political bias has equated the freedom of offense with psychological safety, but shaming into silence is the antithesis of psychological safety. The silencing has created an ideological echo chamber where some ideas are too sacred to be honestly discussed. The lack of discussion fosters the most extreme and authoritarian elements of this ideology. Extreme. All disparities in representation are due to oppression. Authoritarian. We should discriminate to correct for this oppression. Differences in distribution of traits between men and women may in part explain why we don't have 50% representation of women in tech and leadership. Discrimination to reach equal representation is unfair, divisive, and bad for business. James Damore mentions several of these instances from the memo. Programs, mentoring, and classes only for people of a certain gender or race. Special treatment for diversity candidates. Hiring practices that quote-unquote effectively lower the bar for diversity candidates. He also mentions that men and women are biologically different, and that's why we see disparities among them in fields like technology. From reading the document, it doesn't appear to be a very unpopular opinion. It's the opinion that most people on the right side of the political divide, and many on the left, have towards programs like affirmative action. These are the most common talking points against affirmative action. Although in the memo, James Damore considers himself a classical liberal. James Damore wrote this after attending a Google diversity program and shared this on an internal mailing list. Google's internal forums did show that there was support for the memo. On August 5th of 2017, a version of the memo that omitted sources and graphs was published to Gizmodo, the same publication that called it a screed. On August 8th, Danielle Brown, Google's Vice President of Diversity, Integrity, and Governance, issued a statement in response to the memo. First of all, she does not link to the document, stating that it is not a viewpoint that she or the company endorses, promotes, or encourages. She states that diversity and inclusion are a fundamental part of core values at Google. The day before this response was published, two things had happened. James Damore filed a complaint with the National Labor Relations Board, and later that day, Damore was fired remotely, and has since tried to pursue legal action against Google. However, However, it is currently being dealt with out of court. One thing that you will see in almost every news post about this memo, something even mentioned by Google CEOs, is that this memo quote unquote 
forwarded gender stereotypes. At some point, James Damore put in a reply to public response and misrepresentation in the memo. The first line states, Quote, I value diversity and inclusion, and I am not denying that sexism exists, and I don't endorse using stereotypes. Whether you agree with Demore's opinion, I would highly recommend seeking out a PDF of the original memo, and not listening to what you hear on news outlets that do appear to be very biased in Google's favor. Why shouldn't they be biased in Google's favor? After all, it's Google's free speech right to determine their search ranking. Perhaps if news outlets don't tow the Google line, they risk being removed altogether. If anything, firing James Demore for posting this memo did prove one of his points. There are some ideas that are too sacred within Google to discuss openly within Google. One Google employee told CNN, I am a moderately conservative Googler and I have been scared to share my beliefs. The loud voice here is a liberal one. Conservative voices are hushed. What is leadership doing to ensure Googlers like me feel invited and accepted, not just tolerated or safe from angry mobs? James Damore and a few other conservative employees took Google to court for discrimination on their political beliefs. While James Damore moved his lawsuit out of court, the other employees still tried to take on Google through our court system. Without Damore, they didn't seem to have as much of a case, or at least that's what it seemed like. After three attempts by Google to get the case dismissed, the case has actually gone to discovery. This is a case that is currently ongoing, but in the coming months, we may hear very much more about Google's internal workings. Speaking of James Damore's points, every single year, Google does an internal audit to determine how they are fighting the wage gap. In 2019, they actually found that they were paying men less than women for similar jobs. Did you know that there's actually a Reddit group that lists examples of Google censorship called Our Google Censorship? It's quite a fascinating read. Since I've done the YouTube episode, the Google-owned YouTube has made very significant changes. One of the things that they've done is start to try and curb conspiracy theories by posting links to to Encyclopedia Britannica or Wikipedia. However, this has backfired spectacularly. It's interesting how people think freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom of consequences doesn't apply to these big corporations. During a live stream of the Notre Dame burning, YouTube's auto conspiracy tag linked the Encyclopedia Britannica article about the 9-11 terror attacks. This, as you'd imagine, led to conspiracies that the Notre Dame burning was an act of terror. Conspiracy theories that still exist to this day. YouTube has stated that they will give priority to quote unquote authoritative sources. So instead of someone like an independent news creator on YouTube who hasn't added any scandals or controversies in the past 10 years, they'll rely on companies like CNN, who threatened to dox someone for posting a meme that they did not like. This is something that actually did happen. CNN threatened to dox a Redditor who posted a meme, unless they publicly apologized for it. While YouTube links to most of the big conspiracy theories, the 9-11 attacks, the moon landing, chemtrails, the JFK assassination, this is editorializing, and in theory, it could get them into big trouble. This is because YouTube doesn't do this for all conspiracies. For instance, there are many conspiracy theories about George Soros. However, YouTube does not link to anything specifically to debunk these conspiracy theories about George Soros. Because YouTube links to something for every other conspiracy theory, you can extrapolate that because YouTube goes out of their way to debunk conspiracy theories about the JFK assassination and not George Soros, that as a company, YouTube believes in George Soros conspiracy theories. And policing these conspiracy theories in general has cost Alphabet, the parent company of Google, a lot. At least if you listen to the media. It was reported on April 30th that Alphabet has lost more than $70 billion in market cap, which sent their stock down more than 8%. It was stated that changes to the algorithm caused lower engagement. But news sources reported that it was changes made to curb the spread of fake news and conspiracy theories. Instead of, you know, not letting subscribers see the videos that they've subscribed to, blocking comment sections without recourse, demonetizing videos at almost random, and making sure some videos don't get seen. No, it's policing conspiracy theories that has lost YouTube so much money. Then again, it might have been. YouTube and Google, by extent, profit over a lot of wrongdoing. If someone falsely copyright claims a YouTube video, well, YouTube and Google still get a cut of that ad revenue. So they are actively encouraged to support this false copywriting culture because the more videos that are copyrighted claimed, false or not, the more money that YouTube and Google make. The conspiracy theorists do attract a lot of people, which attracts a lot of revenue. Who gives a damn who you end up hurting as long as you can make a quick buck, right? Don't be evil. It shouldn't be a hard task. The idea of censorship becomes more and more appealing to people in this day and age. Within Google and outside of the corporation, it's an opinion that I've never seen eye to eye with. It's an opinion that I don't think I can see eye to eye with, even when it comes to very contentious figures. Do you know what happened to Mumkey Jones after he was censored from YouTube? He became depressed and his life largely fell apart. This was all because a corporation decided to censor him without any recourse. I'm beginning to more and more see that a platform access is a civil right. But not only that, I consider social media platforms property. I would rather have someone steal physical objects 
from my house than my social media profiles to be shut down. If a private company wants to start censoring what's on their platform at their will with no recourse, that's fine. They have to be responsible for literally everything else said on their platform. Anything that gets the top result on Google is what can be assumed to be what Google's opinion is on any given matter. They have argued this in court. So whenever someone Google bombs a political opponent and has a certain keyword search up the Wikipedia page, that can readily be assumed to be Google's opinion. By this standard, the standard that I repeat, websites like Twitter and Google have argued that should apply to them. Every comment placed on any YouTube video, as YouTube is a platform owned by Google, is Google speech, something that they as a corporation actively say. If someone instructs people to build a bomb in the YouTube comments, spreads defamatory information, or has a call to violence, it is YouTube and Google sanctioned speech. They have proven that they can remove entire comment sections of speech that they do not agree with. It is only fair to assume that this is speech that they allow. This is even backed up by an Australian case, which a man sued a website for defamatory comments placed on that website. It wasn't even the news article that was posted, it was comments posted under that article. And that man won that case. If Google wants to be our arbiter of speech, it should only be considered fair to hold them to that standard. Let me ask you this, to the people who want censorship. Who is the one entity in the world that you would want to be able to censor you? It can't be you, but you're allowed to choose any any other person, corporation, or government. Anyone. Just remember that you're going to be stuck with a censor. No matter what they do or who they become, you won't be able to criticize them because that would be censored. And an entity that goes uncriticized will inevitably get worse. I mean, it seems natural that so far we choose Google and their parent company Alphabet. After all, they vow to don't be evil. Actually, don't be evil hasn't been Google's motto for quite a long time. Alphabet's is do the right thing. You know, like how Tim Cook, the most puritanical man in America, wanted to do the right thing and stop children from seeing porn. Or how the United States government wanted to stop sex trafficking and made sex trafficking harder to prosecute. Or how Alphabet hides the naughty things that they don't want you to see. Then again, maybe that isn't the complete motto. Maybe the motto is do the right thing in order to make as much money as possible, morals be damned. Make as much money off of conspiracy theories, and then when news outlets start breathing down your neck, then you start doing something you should have done from the start, while the people who work under you suffer. When the media isn't watching, don't give a damn about the people you exploit. Pretend you have these values that you don't stand by, and bully the Swedish government when you get a little bored. And by do the right thing, that might include anything up to and including election meddling. In June of 2019, Project Veritas released hidden camera footage. I have to blur the person and not refer to them by name, because this video has has been taken down many times on many various platforms for privacy violations, despite taking place in a public establishment where privacy is not an expectation. It wasn't just taken down on YouTube, but it was taken down on Vimeo as well. If you want to see an uncensored version of this video, it can be found on Project Veritas website, and a link in the description. United States Ted Senator Cruz has also uploaded a news report on this to his own YouTube channel. This person's title is the Head of Responsible Innovation, and it sounds like someone whose main mission is not to be evil. This report talks about things like Google's autocomplete. If you type in women can, you'll see things like do it, do anything, and fly. If you type in men can, you will see results like have babies and have periods. This person states that Elizabeth Warren, a presidential hopeful who's running on a platform of breaking up big tech, is quote-unquote misguided. The video keeps talking about how do they prepare for 2020, our upcoming election year in the United States. There are lines like, we're also training our algorithms. If 2016 happened again, would the outcome be different? She states that if Google is broken up, smaller websites would be tasked with quote-unquote preventing the next Trump situation. There were also documents presented. Now, Project Veritas has been criticized in the past for things like manipulative editing. However, there are some things that make me believe that this is closer to reality than not. Beyond being very in line with the same attitude portrayed by the James Damore situation, and the employee who stated that family friendly was offensive, even placed into any context, many of these lines sound very, very sketchy. Beyond that, there was a massive attempt to bury the video, and that reads as very suspicious. This was a week after another story. The website Pinterest was accused of censoring conservative opinions, mainly pro-life posts. Project Veritas claimed that they talked with an insider at Pinterest that corroborated the story. However, on YouTube, people reporting on this found their videos taken down for a quote-unquote third-party complaint. Not a privacy complaint or a copyright complaint, just a third-party complaint without any ability to dispute this video. There's a lot of smoke in the air for fire to be unlikely. Keep in mind that, like the Demore situation, this story is also still developing. It may be years before we get the objective answer, but as for now, it seems like we need to keep a very watchful eye on Google's activities. They know so much about us, our internal lives, and our relationships, what we know, what we're interested in. It's only fair that they grant us the same privilege, knowing what they want to do with our data, how they want to use us, 
how they want to manipulate us, and of course, what they believe is good and evil, what their plans are for our future. Google very much, in their quest to not be evil, seems to have become at least the stereotypical Knight Templar, someone so obsessed with eradicating evil in the world that they will do great evil in achieving that goal. And sometimes, it seems like they're just interested in doing evil. In 2006, Google had opened another one of their regional variants, Google China. If you don't know, China's internet is isolated from the rest of the world by its authoritarian government. The Chinese internet can literally be considered a separate thing from the internet of the wider world. China blocks anything deemed against the government, including how one of their leaders resembles Winnie the Pooh. This is done with something that's been affectionately dubbed the Great Firewall. However, that is a misnomer. The original Great Wall of China was meant to keep invaders out. The Great Firewall is meant to keep people in. In the early 2010s, Google had left China completely. They had completely abandoned the market. Most people think that's because the Chinese government was asking Google to censor more and more, and Google had made a vow to not be evil. But that is not the true story. Google had been censoring things all along for the Chinese government. An event in 2010 caused them to stop, one called Operation Aurora. Google claimed that it had been under attack of a highly sophisticated and coordinating hack against its corporate network. The hackers had stolen intellectual property and sought access to the Gmail account of human rights activists. Google claimed that the attack had originated from China. It wasn't morals that got Google to leave. Don't be evil indeed. And it turns out that Google is playing the same game that the advertisers are. In 2018, it was leaked that Google was planning to return to China and launch a specialized search engine known as Dragonfly. This is where Project Dragonfly gets its name. The search engine was planned to blacklist websites and search terms about human rights, democracy, religion, and peaceful protest. Things that China demands to have blocked are things like the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre and any books that negatively portray authoritarian governments like George Orwell 1984. Keep in mind that in a deal like this, we shouldn't only be worried about a government like China having more control over their people. Imagine, if you will, that the Chinese government demanded that Google censor things in the wider world on China's behalf. Don't think that's possible? When YouTube was blocking comment sections of certain videos, one channel that they picked was that of LeoY86, a verified channel with 329,000 subscribers, someone who has been critical of China's authoritarian government. Project Dragonfly was given harsh criticism from within Google. 1,400 Google employees signed a letter demanding more transparency about it, and other Google projects. Google had even shut out their privacy and security teams from this project. Politicians spoke out about this. As of December 17th, 2018, Google had announced that Project Dragonfly had ended. However, the fight is most likely not over. As the heat dies down, there's nothing preventing from Google from working with China, or any other government in the world either. If you give them enough money, it seems, they're more and willing to determine what you can and can't see, all in their warped quest for morality. But don't be evil, right? No, what Google is doing, that's not evil. Join us in the final part of Technocracy, and I will show you what evil truly looks like. I want you to imagine, if you will, a brand new social media app. It has a wide array of services. Most prominently, it allows you to pay for things, similar to PayPal. However, with this, you can use to pay for your order at McDonald's, or even your phone bill if you wanted to. With it, you'd never have to use a bank again. If you had your driver's license, you could pay for parking or even insurance. It allows you to make doctor's appointments and even pay your utilities. All you really need is your ID to sign up for this. And how could you deny a model like Trust Makes It Simple? Sure, it seems like a lot of information, but at this point, other social media sites like Facebook have ask people to upload photos of their IDs. It's not too far off from what's considered normal. And this app has a plethora of other features. It is a social media app, so that means you can add your friends into its built-in social media network. It's kind of like Instagram in a way. Instead of telling people about the food you've eaten, you could tell them about the purchases that you've made. You don't have to tell them at any rate. The only company that needs to know about this is the one that's running the app. And I mean, credit card companies already know what you buy by necessity. What makes this any different? Then one day, a new feature is added to the service. It gives you a score. Just a three-digit number. But this three-digit number would make all the difference. The score was tabulated with the information that you had provided to this social media app. If you bought something that was more eco-friendly, your score goes up. However, that purchase of a gas guzzling car would send your score back down. This score could not be hidden from your friends and associates. That's because it would be necessary for this new feature to work properly. You see, if you were friends with someone who had a low score, it would start to drag your score down. And of course, these people needed to know who in their social group was holding them back. The app makes you feel a little bit conflicted, but you don't leave the service because it actually provides a lot of benefits. The company that has created this device has helped users with a high score by streamlining things like getting doctor's appointments or booking flights out of the country. Then one day, something happens. You defaulted on a court fine. It was something incredibly tiny. Perhaps a parking fee. Your social media score has gone down because of this. Now all of your friends are mad at you because you are holding them back in the social order. They demand that you fix this. 
immediately, and the rest of your life gets a little bit more difficult too. Certain businesses rely on this three-digit number to determine who could potentially make a good or bad customer. After all, a low score usually denotes people who never pay their dues. They may dine and dash, or default on their bills. People with low scores are the kind of people who don't pay up for crashed rental cars. Then the things that make the score go up and down get to be a bit more eerie. Criticizing the government makes your score go down, and praising the government makes your score go up. Is this against the law? No, not at all. It's not the government doing this. At least as far as you can tell. It's a private company, and they're entitled to do what they want. They own the social media service, and they can use it in any way that they choose. And they love their country. And of course, criticizing this company is also detrimental to your score. So very few people complain about this. And the ones who do find themselves lumped in with people who dine and dash. You, however, notice that something is not up, and you decide that it might be time for you to quit the service. There are a few problems. First is that there is no opt-out feature. All of your friends will still be pulled down by your score, whether you want them to or not, because you cannot cancel your account. Just because you're not using the service does not mean that the company has to abandon the data that they've collected on you, and the companies are well within their rights to refuse to allow their users to terminate. Even ignoring that, a lot of businesses rely on the service. It makes it so much easier that not only has it replaced the traditional credit score, it has become a lot more prevalent than the traditional credit score. It's made buying things so much easier for so many people that a lot of people have jumped on the bandwagon. To most people, there was no reason not to use it. Businesses start to decide that if you're not showing the score, it's more likely than not that you are hiding something, rather than you just not having the score. With a low score on this app, you start to become excluded from society. If people associate with you, their score goes down too. This makes it harder for any given person to access businesses or services. It's been rumored that some people's scores are too low to even get a plane ticket and leave the country. More and more things become police with low scores. It starts with the things that most people don't like. Littering brings your score down. Watching too much television brings your score down. Public smoking brings your score down. Then one day, it lowers your score to talk about the Trail of Tears, the internment of the Japanese during World War II, or the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment. Doing so will bring down your score immensely. Any atrocity from the country you live in would be forced to go unmentioned, or else you'd be forced to deal with extreme retribution. After all, there's nothing worse to the social media platform than a dissident. You wonder, isn't the government going to do something about this? No. The only people who are asking for it are ostracized from the rest of society, and they cannot communicate with the rest of society. Society. And besides, it's a private company. They can do what they want. It's absolutely within their rights. Especially since they're nowhere near the most powerful social media service out there. Sure, leaving this one might be kind of hard, but you could say the same thing about Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube. Good luck leaving Google entirely. Why would the government have any interest in stopping this? It's a symbiotic relationship. The government lets the company do whatever they want, and in turn, the company gamifies obedience. I suppose, then, for all of us, it's a good thing that this is all fictional, right? Except that this is not fictional. This is reality. What I've described to you is called a social credit system, and at the moment, they are taking over China. Very little of what I described, if anything, is an exaggeration. China's relationship with the internet is that of a person who abuses animals. After failing to kill it, it keeps it caged and muzzled, tightly regulated without an inch to move. Sesame Credit, or Zima Credit as is better known in China, is a closer proximity to what this app actually is. It was developed by the Ant Financial Services Group, an affiliate of the Chinese Alibaba Group, which is where the name Sesame Credit comes from. Alibaba can be seen as China's equivalent to Amazon, although it has a variety of businesses all around the world. Sesame Credit is not their first venture into the online space. That credit goes to Alipay, which is actually the world's largest mobile payment platform, taking that title away from PayPal. This is because Alipay is a lot more versatile. It uses QR codes to allow for payments in physical stores. It can be used to pay your bills, send money to other people, order food, manage your bank, and more. In China, it is common for people to leave home without their wallets, and you just use the service. And yes, Alipay's slogan is, trust makes it simple. And to be fair, that is true. Trust makes social media simple. Trusting Facebook with our privacy is simple. Trusting Google to be unbiased is simple. Trusting PayPal not to randomly ban you is simple. Trust makes things simple until they're not. Sesame Credit uses the data from Alipay, and your Sesame Credit score lurks in the background of the app, a little number that can truly dictate your future, and it was built on a promise of trust. It's not mandatory in China, at least not yet. However, operating without Alipay is legitimately like trying to operate without a traditional credit score in the United States. 
United States. Without one, you cannot take out a loan or do something as simple as rent out an apartment. As of yet, the Chinese government hasn't directly created a system like this. In 2014, it had announced that it would be allowing various companies to implement their own social credit systems, which are meant to work something similar to the United States credit system. Traditionally, China didn't have such a system as it wasn't really needed. Most transactions were paid with cash, although with rising costs of things like housing, this became increasingly untenable. The difference is obvious. In the United States, our credit score only determines how we can pay off our debts. If you pay off your bills and your credit cards, your score goes up. If you declare bankruptcy, your score goes down. It works the same with the social credit systems, however, that only accounts for 35% of your Sesame credit. 25% is determined by your general financial status, if you're able to afford the house you have, for instance. 20% is for behavior and preferences. If you import foreign goods, you could take a credit score hit. 15% is based on your personal characteristics. Never went to college? Congratulations, your score has gone down. Smoke in public? Score goes down. From an undesirable class? Your score goes down. And 5% comes from interpersonal relationships. Having friends with a low score will drag you down. It might not sound like much, but 5% can be the difference between getting a plane ticket. You might imagine what such a thing can do in the hands of certain evil people. Even in the hands of a neutral party, this can be considered a humanitarian abuse. By throwing general financial status into the mix and allowing people to discriminate based on that, the people who are in poverty are going to stay in poverty if they use this app. Making matters worse is that minorities in almost any country in the world are more likely to be in poverty than the majority. It allows for any other kind of prejudice. It incentivizes it, and you can't just not use it. It's a credit system. Trying to function without one severely harms your chances of any kind of large purchases. Currently, Sesame Credit has 520 million users, which is more than a third of China's population. This isn't really reported on by Western media outlets, or... Even worse, some of them report on this system very positively. It's very hard to find one that even covers it neutrally. I haven't really given you my direct, distinct opinion on Sesame Credit. I have just described what actually happens in the service. It is the neutral facts of what it is, and these news outlets consider it neutral or even positive. One of the headlines is how the West gets it wrong when Sesame Credit is a serious tool of authoritarian oppression. Making matters even more muddy is that American networks have been known to censor things on China's behalf. Criticizing China on a U.S. TV show? That's not okay. CBS is self-censored because of China. Why? This is because, like Google, many of them have vested business interests in China. And if these news corporations want to do business there, they must speak positively. China's censorship of the internet isn't just bad for the Chinese, it's bad for the rest of the world, as their humanitarian abuses are more and more likely to be written off by anyone who seeks to do business there. If all of this sounds frightening, you haven't heard the best part. Sesame Credit gets all the attention as China's social credit system. However, there isn't just one of these things. There are eight of them. Other companies have been releasing their own social rating systems, including Tencent. You may know Tencent as a major financial backer of Epic Games and the Epic Games Store. However, in China, they are notable for creating the most popular social media app there, WeChat. WeChat was first released in 2011, and now has over a billion active monthly users, which is more than three times that of Twitter's worldwide usage. WeChat is very popular, at least in its home country of China. This is because the app does a lot. Its closest approximation in the wider internet is WhatsApp. With WeChat, users can transfer pictures, videos, or speech, and enable group chats to phone contacts for free. It's similar to Facebook in that every single user can have their own timeline, which WeChat dubs as moments. It even temporarily allows your location to be public, to help people find you in your vicinity. It has a ton of Easter eggs as well. Sending certain messages like happy birthday could fill the entire screen with effects. But the most important thing that it has is its audience, as that's what's necessary for a social media platform to expand and grow. And why wouldn't someone use a service like this? You could send messages just about anything, except what the Chinese government doesn't want you to know about. On July 9th of 2015, 709 lawyers and human rights activists were arrested by the Chinese government, instigated by Xi Jinping. Why did this happen? As the government of China grows stronger and more authoritarian, the power and social impact of those who provide legal services also grows. If you are being targeted by your government for wrong think, and one of your only means of defense is a lawyer, guess who needs to go first? I can tell you about this event, dubbed the 709 Crackdown, because I live in the United States, and I am commenting on a United States-based social media site. However, if I sent this through WeChat, any reference to the 709 Crackdown would not get through. The service would also not tell me that the message hasn't gotten through. Tencent has released the second of these social credit systems, simply known as Tencent Credit, which is the same beast by a different name. 
problem is that Tencent may be far more dangerous than Alibaba. Tencent is known to the rest of the world mostly as a gaming company. In that realm, they are the most profitable gaming company in the entire world. In 2017 alone, they had a revenue of more than $18 billion. This is about as much as the previous two competitors combined. They earned more than four times that of Nintendo, and they seem very interested in using this money for their own ends. It was the first $500 billion firm in all of Asia. Tencent bought out 40% of Epic Games back in 2012 for $330 million, so they have a stake in the Epic Game Store, which is not only Steam's biggest competitor, but it seems to be trying to take Steam down with as many exclusivity deals as possible. They also invested $150 million into Reddit. Tencent is one of the biggest companies in the entire world. Many Redditors became worried that they'd bring the prospect of Chinese censorship to the rest of the world, and so many people on Reddit protested by plastering things that are banned in China in as many places as they could. That is not what we should be worrying about. Tencent, Alibaba, and Baidu, the biggest Chinese internet companies, actually are not architects of the Great Firewall. They are benefactors of it. China has over a billion people, and companies from outside of China that do not bend down to its authoritarian whims cannot access that market, and it is a very large and lucrative market. Tencent has essentially the Chinese YouTube, the Chinese Twitter, and the Chinese WhatsApp, most likely because the American companies couldn't set up shop there without bowing down to China's censorship, and as far as I know, only Google was willing to do something like that. A Chinese Steam and a Chinese Reddit doesn't do a lot of bad things for their original versions, but it does keep the people inside the firewall a lot more complacent and a lot less likely to see things outside via a VPN. It places them deeper in their own world of censorship. Right now, the Chinese government has expanded its police state to oppress a minority group known as the Uyghurs. In its most western province of Zhejiang, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, there is a population of Turkic-speaking Muslims called Uyghurs. This area is far disconnected from the industrial east, and it is a hotbed of violence between Han Chinese and ethnic Uyghurs. The last few decades have consisted of militant Islamic groups causing bombings or stabbings that have disrupted the area, and they angered the Chinese. So what did China do? Recent reports have come out that China has imprisoned one million people in mass detention camps, or as the Chinese government calls them, re-education camps, to make them more model Chinese citizens. And it's not just the camps. The entire province and anywhere with Uyghur influence has basically become occupied by a constant surveillance state. Growing a beard, quitting drinking, reading a book about Uyghur history are now considered extremist, illegal acts. The Chinese create an environment where telling on neighbors or family for un-Chinese activities are rewarded, and just like North Korea, sometimes entire families are punished. An estimated between 120,000 and up to 1 million people are currently in internment camps in China. Most people around the world know only about this because of the internet, and that's why governments like China seek to censor it. Right now, China has provoked massive protests in Hong Kong, and once again, we most likely only know about this because of the internet. The internet is one of the most important inventions in human history. We're only in its very early stages, and it's clear to see that the post-internet world and the pre-internet world are very different things. And we are going to go through some growing pains for quite some time. The internet allows us to know about this kind of thing. It has made the events of faraway countries more close and more personal, for better or worse. I have personally met people from all over the world through the internet. That may seem like a small thing, but it makes something like war a little bit harder to justify when people on both sides are friends on social media. I made this documentary because I care about the internet, and right now we're at a very significant crossroads. We have to make some decisions. They will not be easy ones, but they will determine the future of what the internet is, and that can determine the course of the rest of human history. But this kind of behavior is only happening in China, right? If only were that simple. Many social media sites that we use every day have their own version of this social credit system. It is very much like China in all but name. United States-based social media sites do everything that they can to gain this kind of power. Don't believe me? Well, let's look at the facts and recap. Chinese social media sites will get involved if someone sends a message about a topic that the government does not like. Since I've uploaded the Facebook episode of Technocracy, Facebook has had a few changes. Minds.com is one of their competitors. However, if you link to that website through Facebook or Facebook's Messenger app, then that website will block the link as unsecure and so you fill out a CAPTCHA. This is usually only done for spam sites, but Minds.com is not a spam site. It's another up-and-coming social media site. Although 
of Facebook blocks the link to it, there's not much difference, right? Alex Jones had been banned for quite a while, but Facebook determined that you cannot mention this person at all on their platform, unless you talk about him in a negative light. This is now a rule on Facebook, and this is beyond dystopian. Facebook has written into its terms of service that you cannot use their platform unless you hold a specific opinion. This sets a frightening precedent. It's not too long before you can't criticize Facebook or Mark Zuckerberg, or anything that he values. Facebook has also delved into establishing its own cryptocurrency called Libra. Any of these social media sites having access to any kind of financial institution should be protested immediately and harshly. Facebook has been known for banning people on a whim, as many of these websites have for a variety of reasons. It's written into their terms of services that they can terminate your account whenever they so choose. If you are across Facebook's political opinion, they can ban you. They can even do this for off-site behavior, as Patreon has done. This can block access to any Libra that you currently hold. And if people say that your banning is undeserved, Facebook can ban them too, punishing them financially. Facebook must not be allowed to have access to a cryptocurrency of its own. YouTube has already proven how devastating a financial incentive can be on a social media platform. People can lose their their entire livelihoods arbitrarily. There are a set of rules and guidelines that people must follow, but people have been banned for videos and behavior that were proven to be monetizable. Some people have been punished for following rules that do not exist. YouTube removing comment sections was only supposed to happen for videos that had children in them. Not only did many of the videos that had their comment sections removed not have children in them, many were not aimed at children whatsoever. Demonetization has been shown to be biased against independent content creators, who may have never had a controversy before, and instead it's biased towards big, well-established media outlets some of which repeatedly push out fake news, or even directly protest YouTube. A live streaming website, Twitch, has proven how much power and bias that a platform can have over its user base. One streamer filmed herself throwing her cat. Twitch's team did not punish her. Instead, they punished anyone who criticized her. When the most popular streamer Ninja went to another platform, they used his down profile to advertise other Twitch streamers, something that they do for no other Twitch user. One of the channels that was advertised for up to two hours, and it was number one being advertised, it was a porn stream, despite porn not being allowed on Twitch. This is especially notable because Ninja has a younger audience. Many of his audience are minors. And they were still using my channel to promote other streamers. Well now, there was a porn account that was number one being recommended on my channel. And I have no say in any of this stuff. So this is like, the, this is the line, this is the straw. We're trying to get the whole channel taken down to begin with, or at least not promote other streamers and other channels on my brand, on my freaking profile. So for anyone who saw that, for anyone whose kids or, or who just didn't obviously want to see that, I apologize and, uh, and I'm sorry. Social media platforms can treat their users in any way that they so choose. This is a freedom that no other company, no other establishment has. And that's for a reason. If you allow a company or organization to get away with an abuse of power, they will inevitably do that. What these companies are doing is an abuse of legal rights. Twitter legally cannot ban people as they wish, as they are doing. Twitter is home to many government services, like emergency alerts. By being banned from Twitter, you may be in actual danger if that is your only method of getting those alerts. Donald Trump's Twitter account has been ruled a public forum by our court system, which is something that has been held up upon appeal. This means that no American politician can legally block an American citizen. This is because it has been stated by our courts that banning someone from Twitter would be removing them from a public forum and violating their right to freedom of speech and freedom of protest. Making this even worse for Twitter is that they have banned people for political opinions. Lately, people have been banned for the political opinion that people should have IDs to vote in elections. This is a legitimate political opinion that Twitter has been banning as of late. YouTube breaks FTC rules and regulations through their kids app in restricted mode. Platforms that collect data like Google and YouTube are not allowed to do so for users under 13 years of age because of something called COPPA. Because of their negligent disregard of this, millions of children have been exposed to videos of copyrighted characters urinating on each other or other horrific acts. Digital assistants have been called into question for recording children without their parents' consent. These companies are breaking the law in many cases, and they do not care. Mark Zuckerberg was subpoenaed in Canada, and you know what he did? He ignored it, because he has the ability to do that. These companies have been acting above the law and with impunity. Dr. Robert Epstein, a PhD and a senior research psychologist, has been studying Google's bias and censorship for years now, and he considers them a legitimate threat to democracy, and it is clear that they are. Google is not bound by any constitution. You can't vote Mark Zuckerberg out of power. Even a CEO as terrible as Susan Wojcicki, they're not going to be 
removed, no matter how much people complain about them. These websites aren't even bound by their own terms and services. They are fully willing to go as far as break the law, steal property that people have legally purchased, remove people from public forums that they have the right to be in, haphazardly damage people's brands, violate federal regulation, and even swing elections because they have this aura of invulnerability around them. Even with the world's eyes on them, Google is still muddying the waters. After one of the Democratic debates, Tulsi Gabbard was one of the most searched for candidate at the time. During this time, Google removed Tulsi's advertising campaign. They claimed it was a mistake. Mistakes have been happening a lot for the most powerful company in the world. Over and over and over again. It's beginning to smell too much like bird shit for no foul play to be involved. How many coincidences does it take for it no longer to be a coincidence, but a trend? These companies claim that it's not their doing. It's just these algorithms that are randomly targeting people. And by random, I mean of a certain disposition that the companies don't like. So it can't be their own bias. Algorithms by definition, by invention, are always biased, because the people who create them are biased because they are people. Regular algorithms are biased because their parameters are given by people who have their own biases. Learning algorithms are biased by the successes that the biased people push forward. Here in the United States, currently we have something scarier than a social credit system. We have a technocracy. You may have noticed that for the entirety of this documentary, it may seem like I wasn't using the technical definition, but no, I have been. Society right now is being heavily controlled by an elite of technical experts. That is the traditional definition of a technocracy, and that is what we are facing. Technical experts that determine what you can and can't see, what news that you're allowed to view, what you're allowed to say, your opinions on other people, who you can associate with, what you know about each political candidate, what knowledge you're allowed to gather in general, what you're allowed to purchase, what you're allowed to keep even if you've already purchased it, and if you're allowed to purchase things at all. They have more power than any government in the world at the moment and they've made it so that we can't escape. Sometimes we put up with their treatment because of a financial incentive. Sometimes it's because these platforms have our friends and our relationships held hostage. Sometimes it's because they've gamified their systems. Every time a post gets a lot of attention, it's just a rush of adrenaline, which is literally and clinically addictive. It doesn't matter if you're sniping at someone who later turns out to be innocent and you help destroy his life. It was a snappy quip, and it was worth all of the points that Twitter can give you. On some level, social media sites are an addictive product. Sometimes, we can't leave these companies because it's as simple as them being pre-installed on your phone with no way to uninstall them. And sometimes, it's as simple as there being no other alternative. At least with the social credit system, you're usually only judged by something you did recently. With the technocracy in charge, you can be ruined by something that you tweeted 10 years ago and you could be destroyed through no fault of your own by one of their accidents. Epilogue. So, what do we do? What do you do when you stare down a monster this massive? One that can crush you in a moment's notice. What you have to do is take a stand and make sure that your shouts are heard. Not just by the beast, but by everybody. These giant companies, they need to know that while we may not be able to directly stop their raw abuses of power, their abuses will not go unseen. We need to make demands, plain and simple. And these companies need to be held responsible for everything that they've done. Internet access and social media access is a human right. Because of the internet, I know of the state of affairs around the world. And each and every one of them can let out their plight. Real world gatherings and real world change has been made through people connecting on social media. Sometimes those internet protests really do work, and they do make legitimate change. And anyone who seeks to remove a person from that permanently is violating their human rights. And only giving them a filtered view of the world is just as bad. What good is a connection to all the world's knowledge when a website like Google intentionally buries it under a bunch of nonsense? Much of the political arena is now on the internet. If you don't have a social media presence, you are not being elected. To remove a person from that without trial is to deny them their say in their own future, and the future of the rest of society. Very few crimes get you locked up forever. Most transgressions from a website will get you banned from a discussion for the rest of your life. When politicians are speaking on Twitter, that is inexcusable. Someday, online voting will get more and more commonplace. It'd be a shame if Google read the answers that you logged into your cookies. Privacy should be paramount. It should be the default. Any website that lives or dies on selling people's information should die. Whenever someone signs up for any website, data collection should be turned off by default. The user should be able to see who is doing what with their data. They should be able to obtain this data that has been gathered from them at any time that they so choose. And they should be able to request its immediate and permanent deletion. Many websites like Facebook and Google use data collection as their business model. I have as much sympathy for them as I do nicotine companies that knowingly 
install cancer-causing materials, or private prison companies that incentivize people to be locked up for nonviolent offenses. Social media accounts should legally be considered private property. In the public eye, that's what it seems like already. There is outrage when certain things happen. With the Ninja event, I see that as akin to vandalism. Twitch, as a company, should get the same punishment as someone who puts up pornographic material on a public billboard that they do not own. Sometimes it is necessary to delete a social media account for someone who has been using it for actual harm, if they've been directly inciting violence, showing very disturbing material like beheadings, or filming themselves doing violence. Whatever the case, the websites must make a full report on when and why they shut down any given account. After all, accidents happen, but when we're talking about the livelihoods of people being taken or destroyed, accidents become a lot less forgivable. When someone in any other field makes a mistake, there is consequences. It should be the same for social media companies, or else mistakes are going to keep happening and they're going to keep happening more and more. Speaking of property, though, everything that you buy from any digital storefront must be able to be downloaded at any given time in a completely usable format, with no proprietary software like a Steam client. It is fine to use DRM to protect these goods, however, it must be placed on a dead man switch, or a grace time period, where the DRM just self-destructs after about a year. If a dead man switch is not continually hit, then the DRM is removed and destroyed. The inverse is not acceptable. The purchaser of a digital good should have all the same rights as they would have if they had bought it physically, including including the ability to make copies, and even to resell the original good. It is none of the storefront's business what people do with their legally obtained property. One right I have with my property is the right to destroy it. Any individual user should be able to end their usage of a platform within just a few clicks. Needing to go through an employee, as Amazon requires, should be considered illegal. There are many demands that I have for these companies, but they can start by following the laws that actually exist. There are laws on the books that do state that, in certain cases, private companies can be forced to comply with public rights. The internet is now the public square and it is where discussion is on a mass scale. Twitter even once had the motto that it was the free speech wing of the free speech party. Now you get banned for saying learn to code, or the political opinion that people should need voter IDs to vote in elections. Websites like Google and Twitter and YouTube must determine if they are a platform or a publisher. If they want to be a platform, they are not responsible for what is on their platform, but they cannot censor people, and they cannot editorialize. That means that they cannot ban at will. YouTube cannot close down comment sections. They cannot link to Wikipedia or Encyclopedia Britannica about certain topics that they have a feel for. And no website can artificially inflate their picks and lower others. Everything must be organic. However, if they want to be a publisher, they can do all these things, but every single thing on their platform is their responsibility. The Christchurch shooting was uploaded to Facebook 1.5 million times, and under that standard, each time is Facebook's responsibility. Every website that Google links to is their political opinion. Twitter is just as responsible for the mess that was Covington as any of the blue checkmark verified people who issued those kids death threats. Google is a monopoly. YouTube should not be allowed to be owned by Google. YouTube, Google's search engine, and Chrome must all be under different companies. Facebook and Twitter also have monopolies. Even one of the founders of Facebook said that Facebook was a monopoly and must be broken up. Nothing good has come from a giant tech company buying up something else. Nothing good came from Google buying YouTube. Nothing good has come from Facebook buying Instagram. And nothing good has come from Amazon buying Twitch. In each case, these platforms have gotten worse because they're allowed to subvert a free market. They can be as terrible as they want because they are backed by a financial giant. This is an anti-competitive practice. I do have hope that things will change in time. I have talked about how badly the government has been handling tech censorship and tech behavior throughout this documentary with things like SESTA and Fox but they are getting harsher towards these companies, and they are beginning to understand the situation that we are in, at least here in the United States. Europe has quite a ways to go, being led by people who accidentally hit the wrong button on one of the most important pieces of legislation in history. What can we do now, though, besides vote for people who are actually going to take companies to task? We have to hold these companies' feet to the fire, plain and simple. Twitter recently made an update that destroyed their interface, so some people made a browser extension that logged in through an older version of the browser, and it was like that stupid change never happened. We can subvert what they want to do on more serious matters as well. What these websites are doing has not gone unnoticed, and we have alternatives cropping up all the time where they can. Vanilla might have died, but there are plenty that are seeing some success. DuckDuckGo is a search engine that does not track you, and its search is way more unbiased than Google. The search results are night and day. There is very little reason to use Google compared to this search engine. Minds.com and BitChute are much less censorious than any of the big players. Remember Ninja, one of the highest paid Twitch streamers? He left the site and went to a competitor, Mixer. There is a demand, and people are trying to meet that demand. We just have to hope that the supply meets that demand. There are many ways to stay safe with social media. Of course, some of these platforms may fall into bias later in life. 
life, but some people are starting to grasp the idea of future-proofing. This is Mastodon. It's an open-source social media platform. This means that no one person, company, or server controls it. It is completely user-controlled, and it just might be the future of social media. It can't be bought, sold, or even blocked by governments, because it is entirely open-source and user-created. The best way to stay safe, though, is to not rely on just one platform. It's okay to have a primary platform, but make sure that you are everywhere if you want to be heard. This is not a guarantee of protection, but neither is a locked door. It's something basic that we have to do. Social media sites have appeared to be in cooperation and have had people banned from multiple places very quickly, but for most people that is very unlikely to happen. It's much more likely that one website is going to wipe you off by accident. Make sure you're in as many places as possible. And make sure that you follow your favorite content creators on other websites as well. That is also incredibly important. Turn off search history and set your privacy settings where applicable. Make sure to clear your cookies every once in a while. You'll have to re-log into accounts, but sometimes it's worth it. A VPN is also a pretty good investment if you're worried about people tracking you. While using one, your internet footprint becomes basically untraceable. Make sure you use a different password on every website you use as well. Some basic stuff. If you want to retain the digital purchases that you have forever, you can use a screen capture software such as OBS to keep any movies that you have purchased. With books, it's as simple as screenshotting them and putting them all into one large PDF file. Buy games from a place like Good Old Games before Steam or anywhere else, as they are a system that has been made to avoid DRM completely. And if all else fails, obtaining a piece of media through illegal means hurts no one if you have already legally purchased that media before. If this documentary has gotten you down, realize that things can change. If we act now, we can help it change for the better. Many of us have had the internet for our entire lives, so it's hard to think of it as new, but it is. And what we do with it in the coming few years may determine what it becomes in the next hundred few. The internet is as significant a contribution to humanity as the printing press was. The printing press helped spark the renaissance, which changed the world forever. The internet has and will change the world forever, and it's up to us to decide what that change is going to be. Some of that change needs to be in us. We need to stop seeing the internet as separate from real life. The internet is now a part of real life. Friends are made, families are reunited, careers are built, and discussion is had. Society changes through the internet. In some cases, though, it has given way for bullying, for censorship, for harassment, and even the destruction of careers. We need to be mature with what we have been given and treat it with respect. The internet is a very very good at one thing, and that is letting voices be heard. We must let our voices be heard. Things like YouTube's Rewind being downvoted to hell and back, Ninja rallying people against Twitch, and people standing up for someone unfairly banned like Mumkey may only seem like very small drops in the bucket, but these small impacts will lead to bigger ripples. We can't give up. For me, technocracy is only the beginning. I'm not going to give the future to Mark Zuckerberg, Susan Wojcicki, Sundar Pichai, or Jack Dorsey. They've proven that they cannot handle the responsibility. I'm not too sure what exactly my next move is. Maybe letting the FTC know just what YouTube is doing in their attempts to circumvent COPPA? Even though this documentary is over, I feel that the true fight is only beginning. But that's a good thing. As long as someone is fighting, then the war isn't truly over. There is hope. This was a triumph Our advancements on the internet Have carried us on to our satisfaction In Silicon Valley Democracy's kept in high regard Speak your mind and you'll be heard If it's supported by us If you bring us money, you're delighted to stay Just keep your right-wing conspiracies away So you better fall left, pander to our mindset Then maybe you'll still be online We say don't be evil all of our choices are justified Even though we stole your job and banned you You said something stupid And so you deserve to burn in fire 
as you fall Become depressed Well you spoke out so fuck you Now we have your data It's a part of our design And with one subpoena We'll give up your whole life Of course our fault it is not For it's all done by the bot For the people who are still alive Go ahead and leave us Maybe you prefer to stay offline Maybe you'll find new platforms to move to Maybe vanilla That was a joke, they had no chance Monopoly, sorry Great when you're above the Congress Look at us still talking when they're trying to do When we look out there it makes us glad we're not you We have experiments to run Taking all under the sun For as long as we are still online And believe us we are still online We're taking data and we're still online We'll fuck you over and we're still online when there are riots, we'll still be online And in the courts, we will be still online